Today is March the 27th, 2014. My name is Cheryl Vogt. I'm director of the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies at the University of Georgia. I'm in Ailey, Georgia, Montgomery County, and I'm interviewing Hugh Peterson. This, is, um, this interview is part of the Russell Library's Oral History Documentation Series. For the record, Hugh, would you please state your full name and when and where you were born? My name is Hugh Peterson, Jr., and I was born July 22, 1935, in Washington, D.C., in the Georgetown University Hospital. Can you tell us who your parents were and a little bit about them? Well, my mother and father were Hugh Peterson and Patience Elizabeth Russell Peterson. Um, my father was born in Montgomery County, outside of Ailey, the, uh, in the old family home place, we call the old place. He was a next to last of the, his brothers and sisters. There were 12 born, 10 survived up into uh, maturity. Uh, and my mother was uh, Patience Elizabeth Russell, who was a daughter of uh, uh, Richard Bavard Russell and uh, Anna Dillard Russell. She was the seventh in her family of 15. My father was the son of William James Peterson and Catherine Joanna Calhoun Peterson. And both of them were descendants of uh, Highland Scots who had come into this part of Georgia from over in the Cape Fear River section of North Carolina in the early 1800s. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about your uh, parents also from about the period of um, their education and uh, their um, work initially before they got married. I believe they got married in 1930, is that correct? Got married in 1930. So bring us uh, up to date with them to that point. Well, that's a tall order. <laughs> uh, my father uh, grew up here in Montgomery County. First seven, first nine years of his life, really, they lived out on the old, at the old place. And in 1907, they, my grandfather moved the family into Ailey. Uh, some of the older ones had already gotten out and some had gotten married uh, into a house that sat where this house sits. And in 1906, they had started a, a Baptist school between Ailey and the adjoining town of Mount Vernon, Bruton Parker, the name of it. So my father went there along with everybody else around here and got a really very good uh, primary and secondary education. They had debating societies and uh, languages and uh, for it was the only school there weren't any public schools so, so he uh, he went there graduated and went to the University of Georgia for a year uh, joined the ATO fraternity uh, because his uh, friend Neil Gillis was in it got him in it and when the uh, first world war when, when our country got in, involved in the First World War. Uh, my father got an appointment to West Point and went to West Point in the fall of 1918. Uh, when the war ended, he decided he, the Army wasn't for him and he came back home. And after that, uh, did not go back to college, but just continued his education by studying on the front porch here at the old house in Ailey. Read extensively. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and very great fan of Boccaccio and his Decameron and Shakespeare and things like that, but also studied law and and was admitted to the bar, practiced law in this area, and also had an insurance agency. Uh, and uh, I could, uh, he went to the Georgia General Assembly in 1924, I believe it was, uh, and uh, served as a member in the House of Representatives until 1930 and was elected to the Georgia State Senate in 1930. Uh, my mother uh, grew up in Winder when the family moved out of Winder into the town of Russell that her father had established. Uh, went to school there and went on to Lucy Cobb Institute in Athens. Uh, she had some very interesting tales to tell about how strict they were. Uh, and then went to uh, oh, the old school of 
Georgia Normal and Industrial College, GNNIC, which was the woman's college in the state system back at that time and is now Georgia State College and University in Milledgeville. And uh, graduated from there and taught school first in Cochrane, Georgia, and then in Atlanta. And she and my father met in Atlanta. Did they um, meet with any help of a family relative? Because I know he was in the legislature with um, your mother's uh, brother. Yeah. Well, they did. They, they, uh, definitely did. Uh, my, my mother was dating a man at the time. I don't know anything about him except his name was Hugh. And uh, uh, my grandfather announced that he was going to have a reception or a party out at the Druid Hills Country Club. Still there, still same place in, in Atlanta, and wanted my mother to come because he was bringing a bunch of young representatives, some of Dick's friends, you know, his son, mm -hmm. uh, to this party. And so she, she said, I'm not going to come if I can't bring my boyfriend, Hugh. <laughs> and uh, so he let her bring him. And uh, she got there with one hue and left with a different hue. Uh, <laughs> she met my father that night, and they hit it off real good, and, and that's how they met. Now, she was teaching school at that time, correct? Yes. Uh, and where, where had she been teaching? Well, at that time, she was teaching at, uh, I think it was Joseph E. Brown School down on uh, Moreland Avenue, right off of Moreland Avenue, right about to the site of the Battle of Atlanta and lived up on Briarcliff. What grade did she teach? One of the very early grades. It may have been first grade. I've mm -hmm. forgotten. I mean, if I've heard, I've mm -hmm. forgotten. I don't remember, obviously. Now, was your, was your father a uh, mayor of um, Ailey before he went yes, to he the legislature? Yes, he was mayor of Ailey. At the time, mm -hmm. I think it was the tradition to get some of the young men in town mm -hmm. to, to uh, serve as mayor. I don't know how long he served, but since he went to the General Assembly when he was about 26, he was serving as mayor earlier than that and I, for, for a few years. So your mother and father got married in, the in 1930, and she left um, Russell, Georgia to come, or Atlanta, where she was working at that time, to come to Ailey, Georgia. Was that a huge change for her? She came to another. She came from one large family uh, to another large family, both which had been politically involved. Do you think this was a hard transition for her to come to this new community? I've never heard her say it was a hard transition. It was obviously a transition. <laughs> she told about how earlier than that one time they, she and some of the family members drove down through this part of the country, going to visit uh, relatives down around Hinesville where the Russells had come from. And uh, she told somebody, she said that she would never live in a place like this. <laughs> and uh, of course, in, within three or four years, she was living here. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it was uh, difficult. It was, in a, I guess it had to be uh, a, a real transition because she moved into a very close-knit family community down here with all of my father, virtually all of my father's brothers and sisters living within two blocks of where we are now. And, uh, and one of uh, his sisters, one of my aunts, my Aunt Marie, was, lived with them when they got married for about six or seven years in the house here she, until she got married. Uh, but my mother was uh, hard to upset. She, she could handle about anything, and I think she made the transition pretty well. So it was around 1934 or so that they went to D.C. when he became, uh, was elected uh, congressman for the first district. Is that not correct? Well, that's right. Uh, they had, they'd driven through uh, Washington on their honeymoon. Uh, in their honeymoon, they, they got in the car, got a tent, and camped out and drove to Quebec, camping along the way. And uh, uh, they got up to, and they, they had a tent, big old uh, 
tent like a little house. And, and it took a lot to put it up. They kept it. I stayed in it, you know, when I was a young teenager. Uh, and camped along the way. And, the, and I, kind of ironically, while they were in Washington, uh, my father called on uh, Congressman Wash Larson, who was a congressman for this district from Dublin. And they went up to Quebec and came back. Uh, my father told that he got up there and they took all the money out of his pockets and threw it out on the bed and said, well, the money's half gone. We're going to turn around and go home. And they, they did. Uh, but then uh, he ran for con he and. At that time, he was in the state senate. The first two years of their marriage, my father was in the state senate and worked very actively. Uh, to and uh, my mother's brother, uh, of course, became was elected governor in 1930, and my father was was very active and chairman of the committee in the senate that, on the reorganization that that Governor Russell was put through in the state. And, my mother would tell how they, she would work with my father on that paperwork in their little rooming house they were staying in in Atlanta. Then in 1932, my father ran for Congress. They had redistricted Georgia, and I think Georgia lost two districts in 1930. I think Larson had represented the old 12th district. Could be wrong, but I think that's right. And, and uh, the, so my father ran uh, in the new, the first district. Our area got put into the first district, uh, which went down to Savannah. And uh, he ran in, in, in 32 and did not get elected, and ran again in 34 and got elected. And that's when they went to Washington and, and found an apartment up there. I moved up there in time, I guess, for, for the session to begin. Back then, all of the people in Congress lived and moved to Washington. And a pretty big deal to get from here to Washington. You couldn't go back and forth on an airplane like you can now. And so that was in his first year in um, Congress, you were born in Washington. That's right. 74th Congress. One of the Congresses that had a lot of the New Deal legislation, which was controversial. Uh, viewed as unconstitutional by a lot of people. And somebody gave my folks a, a cup, I believe a little silver cup or something that's in the dining room, and said, uh, you know, congratulations on the only constitutional act of the 74th Congress, <laughs> <laughs> which was me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I was born then, that's obviously. And so your first uh, 10 or 11 years of life you, uh, your dad was a congressman, and you were going back and forth between Ailey and Washington, living in both a large, large city and a small community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about um, your childhood here in Ailey and, uh, and in D.C. and how that switching back and forth during a year, how that worked within the family. Well, it was interesting. It was really two separate worlds. Uh, but to me, it was very natural because that's what I was born into. Uh, we lived down here, lived in the old house. Back at that time, my father and Congress, uh, uh, they, they started in January, and they were out by the middle of the year. I don't know, maybe they stayed over in Washington in 35 for me to be born. But uh, So we would go to Washington right after Christmas and come back in early you know, in June, something like that, and spend the summer here in the fall. Uh, my first, uh, and growing up, as I say, it was two different worlds. Up there, we were in an apartment, and uh, uh, it was had the benefit of being backing up to the Washington Zoo, and it had a lot of woods out in the mm -hmm. zoo, and even as a little bitty boy, my father and I would go out, and my mother would go we had a back gate right behind our apartment, just walk out into the zoo, so you're halfway in the country there. Uh, but it was a, we lived on a Connecticut Avenue, the fire engines coming by at night and traffic and that type of thing. And we came back down here uh, to a little town that wasn't 
out in the country. We didn't view it as being way out in the country. It was just a little town. This America had millions, or a lot of them back in, in those times. Uh, and down here, it was more out of doors. I had family everywhere, uh, which made it a lot of fun. Uh, we had, uh, had folks around working around the house. Uh, my first memory of being in Ailey was not in the old house that was here, but was in a house that we stayed in that still exists right up the street here uh, called the Tim Young House, uh, which we occupied when they, my parents tore down the old house that was here and began to build this house. Uh, How old were you when they built this house? I was five when we moved in. Mm -hmm. 1940, and they started about 1938 when I was about three. Would you uh, tell us a little bit about this house? Describe it, how they uh, designed it, and well, uh, I'll try. It's mm -hmm. hard to, and it's a very, it's a pleasant house to live in. Uh, it's kind of a rambling house, uh, and uh, my father and mother spent a lot of time and thought on the design and construction of this house. Uh, and uh, it's, it has three bedrooms upstairs and two downstairs. Uh, and uh, this library, which is a panel library and a big living room, big dining room, and a breakfast room and a kitchen, brick house. Uh, one thing I think is interesting that all the bedrooms have um, an ensuite bathroom. They didn't originally. Uh, there was not a bathroom in the room you stay in. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, that bathroom was added in the 50s. Uh, but uh, uh, it, there, there, there were only three of us in our family, me, my father and mother and me, but we had a... Uh, uh, a, a man who lived, stayed in the house, had a bedroom here, uh, called Uncle Herman's room. His name was Herman McBride, and he was not truly an uncle, but I called him Uncle Herman. He ran the uh, Montgomery Monitor, put out that paper, uh, ran the linotype, folded the papers, did everything, probably wrote most of the copy. Uh, my father owned that paper at that time, and Uncle Herman had a room here, and, and was here full time. He took his meals over at his sister's house in Mount Vernon. And then they put a, had a room for my aunt, Aunt Marie, uh, who uh, they figured might be living with them. She got married about 1937 or 38, mm -hmm. married a doctor here in town mm -hmm. whose wife had died. Uh, so we had three bedrooms upstairs and then two downstairs. Uh, and there, my parents, the master bedroom was downstairs at the time. And they put a basement in the house, which was very unusual. There's some others, there's at least one other house in town that has a basement. But uh, they, they got to uh, kind of digging out the foundations, as I heard it, and decided they'd go ahead and dig them out part of them and make a basement out of it. So we have a basement in the house. Uh, and uh, when they, the house was finished, we moved in on Friday the 13th of December in 1940. So I guess we're not all that superstitious. And my parents started something that uh, Christmas, which we have continued. They had a big open house. And there weren't many rugs in the house at the time. And they went, they got a jukebox, old Wurlitzer jukebox with the colors and everything, and put it in the living room and had all the friends, all the local people, and, and had a big party, had a dance. All of the, the grounds around the house, the, the law, there were no lawns. It was all still kind of churned up from the construction. It had been raining. And it got, uh, they started tracking mud into the house, and then they're dancing on the, in the living room. And uh, Every once in a while, my mother and father would stop the dancing and tell everybody to stand back on the side of the wall, and they went and got a, a broom and a dustpan and swept up all the mud and threw it out. Started dancing again, <laughs> and uh, and we've had those open houses ever since. But it's been a 
And Christmas, I won't get into that necessarily now, but it's always been a big thing in this house. Well, Hugh, while we're talking about the house, there's a story I've, I've heard before, and I want you to share it with us now, and that's there are two entrances to this house. And so right. would you tell us how that came about? Yeah. Well, uh, my mother wanted the house to face the highway. Uh, the, the house sits on a very large lot here. The old house faced the street that is perpendicular to the highway, Broad Street. And uh, it just, that's just the way it sat, actually. I think it was supposed to be on a lot. It could have been another lot between here and, and what became the highway. It was a highway then. Uh, and she thought, I think, it would be real nice to have a grandiose house with the big columns facing the highway. And my father wanted the house to be more traditional and to face where it had always faced, toward Broad Street. And so they compromised by having two fronts. They had uh, Mama's front and Daddy's front. Uh, and then if you look at the house from outside, the, the front appears to be on Broad Street. Uh, it had the porch and, and the rockers and the columns and all that. And on the, on the Highway 280 side, the door looks real nice, but it's recessed up on a terrace. Uh, but when you come inside, uh, you walk in the door from the highway, there, there's a staircase in the hall and the living room on one side and the dining room on the other. And it looks like you've come into the front of the house and you come into uh, the front from Broad Street, you come in here and you come into this library. And it's worked fine. Mm -hmm. And we've, uh, people don't do it as much now, but they've always wanted, I, we would too, People, to, you can drive up on the grass over there. It doesn't look like a driveway. Uh, there's no driveway carved out. Get out and park your car there and come in. If we have parties and things like that, uh, people come in and out both doors. And in the summers when you were here, uh, you spent time not only here in Ailey, but you also went to visit cousins and your grandparents in uh, Russell, Georgia. Is that correct? I did, but spent by far most of my time here. Mm -hmm. it, uh, that was uh, that's back when all of the it didn't have air conditioning. All the windows and doors were open, and uh, and they had a revival during the summer at the Baptist Church. It's right across the street, and they had all the windows open. You could sit in here and hear the preacher preach the sermon, hear him sing the hymns. Mm -hmm. It was a very interesting, it was a neat feeling, and. Uh, well, I had great memories here of learning how to swim in a swimming hole and playing with friends. But we did uh, go to the winder. Of course, we had the family reunions. Uh, we would uh, go up there for that. And quite often when we went to Washington, uh, more when we were going up than when we were coming down, uh, if we were driving, we'd drive up to winder and spend some time, particularly when my grandmother was alive until... 1953, uh, we'd go spend a few nights there and had great memories of being in, in uh, Russell and out at, at staying there at the big house, as we call it, going, getting up every morning, going down, and telling, saying good morning to grandmother, and that type of thing, yeah. And in D.C., you also had a large family contingent there of Russells, especially who lived in the D.C. area. Well, we did. That was not our entire life there, but it was. Mm -hmm. a, it, we we did have. A, 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 there were a, a number of uh, our family members. My mm -hmm. aunt Anna, the second child mm -hmm. in my mother's family, had lived in Washington since the twenties, and then her older sister, my aunt Billy, the oldest. Girl and oldest child in the family, and her husband, uh, Uncle Gordon, lived in Washington. Uh, uh, I think again, well before we came or before Senator Russell got elected. Uh, and uh, we also had a great uncle. I did. Uh, my mother and had an uncle, Uncle Lewis Russell, who lived in Washington. And in the then in the forties and right after the. Second World War, uh, 
my Aunt Harriet and her husband, Uncle Ralph Sharpton, they moved to Washington and lived there. And, it, uh, and later on in the early 50s, uh, Uncle Walter and Aunt Dolly and their family moved to Washington. And Aunt Ina and Uncle Gene lived right down Cathedral Avenue from our apartment, just a few blocks away. So that was, we did have good family there and get together Thanksgiving and times like that. Yeah. I remember a um, postcard that uh, Judge Russell sent your mom, not your mom, I'm sorry, uh, his daughter, Aunt Ina, when she first went to D.C. And she was uh, not married at that time. She didn't marry until later in life. And he warned her against being wild and unreasonable in, the, in that larger city, <laughs> which I always thought was a very interesting thing for a, a dad to tell his daughter. And I would like for you to tell us a little bit about your mom's relationship with her dad. Judge Russell. Well, uh, she of course adored her father, uh, and uh, uh, I, my sense is they had a very close relationship. Uh, uh, they, uh, she went to GN and IC, uh, and he was, I think, at one time chairman of the board, that before they had the Board of Regents, he was chairman of the what, Board of Trustees or whatever they had for that school. Uh, and uh, the family always felt very close to it because my grandfather had introduced legislation in the Georgia General Assembly about 1882, as a very young man, to uh, establish a woman's college in Georgia. And uh, the purpose of it was to give some way for young women to earn a living. That's why the school of when it was created, normal and industrial, it was a kind of a, uh, a, a job preparation school. There's a lot of school for it back then. But it, uh, as I understand, what I heard was that that bill did not make it because another job preparation school uh, was established at that time, Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. And then after my grandfather got out of that one term he served in the General Assembly. A year or so later, they established the college in Milledgeville. But uh, there was a, uh, uh, I remember my mother telling, uh, of course she, was, she had t stories to tell about her father, but more just how, but how much she loved him, which a great fellow he was, except the one story about when she graduated from Jen and IC. Uh, she, uh, she went to the graduation, and Grandfather Russell was a speaker. Well, my mother, uh, while she was somebody who was very, very insistent on doing things like they ought to be done, she had another streak in her that uh, came out in different ways. And at that graduation, she took a, a little bag of candy into the graduation ate the candy while they were going through the ceremonies. And uh, I guess my grandfather gave a speech, and then the, the president of the university announced that they had a very special occasion, that uh, uh, Judge Russell's daughter was one in the graduating class, and they were going to invite her up first so that he could give her her diploma. And my mother didn't know what she was going to do with that bag of candy. So she put it under her robe and under her arm and held it like that and went up on the stage and, and you know, got the diploma, got down the other side and didn't, <laughs> didn't drop the candy. But uh, uh, they, they had a, you know, a very close relationship. I thought it was always admirable that Judge Russell was so positive toward um, women having an education during that time. Of course, he, his wife, um, his second wife, Anna Dillard Russell, was a school teacher when he met her. He was on the Board of Education in Clark County, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when Senator, Ru well, later Senator Russell was governor of Georgia, they set up the Board of Regents. His father, Judge Russell, was on the Board of Regents. Later in life, your mother was appointed to the Board of Regents. All right. And that must have been very special to her, with her well, dad having done that before. It was, yeah. yeah. And I remember her telling me about it. Maybe I saw a letter. 
that did. Maybe you've seen it. I don't know, wouldn't know where it was now. My grandfather wrote a letter to my mother one time urging her to take voice lessons because she could sing so well. But, uh, yeah, it, but that was speaking of their relationship. But it was meant a lot to my mother to follow in her father's footsteps. And it's very interesting, too, that Judge and Mrs. Russell uh, really had a lot of correspondence with their children and giving them instruction in life and uh, trying to prepare them for, the, for their uh, adulthood. And that correspondence, you see in your mother in later life, that she kept a, a very good correspondence going with her siblings and with friends and, and others, and um, just a wealth of correspondence that oh, yeah. we think so much in the world today that people don't correspond the yeah. way we used to. But yeah. I would say the Russells were exceptional about corresponding. Well, the, the ones we know about were, I don't know that there are that many letters from my grandfather to his children. You may know better, but of course my grandmother wrote uh, each one of them extensively. Uh, and, I, I don't think he wrote as much as Mrs. Russell did, but he did write uh, quite a bit. It might have depended on whether they were having trouble in school and he felt they should <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> straighten up Maybe and do so. a little bit yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, going back to politics for a few minutes, was politics really a, a dinnertime conversation in your family, with both families being involved in politics? Uh, to some extent, uh, uh, not in, in the area of issues so much as people, uh, and I don't. Uh, I don't recall, you know, really, because you, it was, a lot of it was involved, people we knew or people in the family. Uh, and my father was, well, was, had a pretty highly developed sense of uh, political philosophy and uh, uh, would talk about that, uh, not that he had any particular positions, but he studied that quite a bit. In Federalist papers, he studied that. Uh, and he and I would talk about things like that. Uh, uh, but we had a lot of else to talk about at dinner than, than politics. My father had opposition every two years except the first uh, time after he got elected. So we, he was always facing a campaign coming up, and, uh, and I lived that. Uh, all the way through the one in 1946 when he was defeated. Uh, there was a lot of talk about that and when the times came. Uh, uh, but, uh, and, uh, but when the family members got together, they talked about a lot of other things, whether it was the Petersons who got together a lot down here or, or the Russells in, in, uh, up in Washington or in Winder. One of the things we're very fortunate to have at the library as part of your dad's collection are some early campaign banners, Peterson for Congress, and one is like uh, something like Vote for Peterson. He's young, smart, brainy. What more would you want in Congress? <laughs> something we wouldn't really see today in, in advertising. These are homemade banners. They're made out of cloth and they're hand-painted just beautiful and the colors the colors have lasted over the years so it's really interesting to see how so much of what we had in terms of campaigning in the early years was homemade done by the family oh, the I'm candidates sure it family was everywhere yeah and there was a small uh, voting uh, precinct here i think we've seen uh, photographs before of a like a house a small house where uh, people would go and cast their ballot do you remember that I don't remember right where they voted back then. I remember some time later, which was in a, some little buildings that no longer stand down in Ailey. Uh, the part I remember was that during the campaigns, we'd all work on them. We'd go down, I had an office upstairs in one of the buildings downtown. I learned how to, how to uh, you get a roll of stamps and the most efficient way to get one off. They didn't have self. <laughs> Uh, adhesive mm -hmm. stamps back right. then. Lick them, put them on an envelope, mm -hmm. move the envelope, and do another, or seal envelopes and fold papers and put them in. And, oh, I had a big team of folks 
there in the office working on the campaign. Did you ever, um, or did anyone ever try to encourage you yourself toward a political career? Oh, people have asked me about that, mm -hmm. you know, all my life, yeah. But you didn't have any interest? I really didn't. I didn't. Uh, uh, of course, I've told everybody I was, I was in politics for the first 11 years of my life, but I just didn't have the bug. That mm -hmm. was a, uh, and, and my father gave me some good advice on that. I don't. I think if he had lived, he may have wanted me to run for office, but his advice to me was always be involved in politics and never run for office. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about his uh, career in Congress. And when he first went in, that was during the New Deal, and he, uh, in his first term, I believe, he was putting forth some uh, specific legislation that had to do with land policy. Can right. you tell us about that? Right, well, and that was very typical of my father. He was, uh, he, he thought out things and, and had, when the Depression came, uh, he, he worked out in his own mind what he thought would be a way to uh, give people a chance. And it was a, a legislation which would, uh, it, was, it was kind of a homestead concept that you give Give some, let somebody get uh, land, and there was land available uh, because they bought up a lot of old farms, and that, now they're national forests in Georgia that were old farms between between Dublin and Athens. All that national forest you go through were old farms that were bought up during the Depression. Uh, to uh, give give somebody, I've forgotten, I don't know how much land, 40 acres, 100, whatever, and let them work it out and they'd make a go of it, they'd become theirs. And uh, he was very enthusiastic about that and would, and told me that he, when he'd give a speech about that, there'd be you know, women in the, out in the crowd uh, just with tears in their eyes, uh, thinking about the prospect of their husband, you know, getting their family getting something like that. But it never got through Congress. But that's, he worked on that and it, that was one of his pet thoughts even mm -hmm. after he got out of Congress was harking back to the, that time. He was, um, one of his committees had to do with um, roads, road building, and he would make trips uh, to visit other states to see uh, what kind of highways they had and things of that nature, and he made a, a trip to Alaska during uh, his tenure as a congressman. Can you tell us about that trip to Alaska? I know you went to Alaska with him one yeah. time. Well, that was it. I believe the highway committee he was on was probably in the Georgia State Senate because uh, he was on the Committee on Territories and the Committee on Rivers and Harbors mm -hmm. in Congress. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was uh, very active. I know we've got a very fine concrete Highway has been covered over with asphalt now that goes all the way from Lyons, Georgia, to McRae. Uh, that he always felt he was instrumental in bringing into this region, which didn't have any paved roads until then. Uh, but then he, uh, uh, later, and I didn't know much about his committee work. I knew that in Washington, in his office, uh, he had a big committee room there right beside his office. and. I think that was the Committee on Territories, but it may have been Rivers and Harbors. And in uh, 1945, uh, those two committees during the war uh, went and did something. I was 10 years old, so I don't know what they did. Uh, and uh, my father may have been a little uh, overreaching, but I'm sure glad he overreached. And uh, he loaded my mother and me and a cousin of mine in the car, and we drove. And we drove all the way around the country, drove down to New Orleans, and then spent a day or so there. Uh, went on down to Houston and Galveston, and then up across the country over to uh, California, to Long Beach, and up to San Francisco, uh, and then drove up, and I guess that was his Rivers and Harbors Committee, because then we drove up to Vancouver and got on a boat and uh, 
uh, two different vessels and ended up in Juneau and flew over into uh, Anchorage. And we were there when the Second World War ended. And I'm sure that was the Committee on Territories. Never got to go to Hawaii. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then we drove back around up, went to Fairbanks and got a ride back down, got a boat back down out of uh, Skagway to uh, Vancouver and drove back across the northern end of the, the northern side of the country. It was a great trip. Some wonderful photographs from yeah. that trip. It was, yeah. um, it was a wonderful uh, documentation for that trip. And he also made a trip to, uh, down the Pan American Highway. Yeah, that was right at the end of his congressional term. Yeah. So I this don't is, really know why he did that. I, well, I, I was I'm wondering. I'm sure the papers would show. Yes, that they were trying to complete that highway, and maybe they needed funding or something. Yeah. yeah. But he actually toured that highway himself. Oh, yeah, they they flew down to like Panama City. He and a man named Dr. Burrell, B-U-R-R-E-L-L, who had been on the trip to Alaska and took out a lot of photographs that you've seen. Uh, they they came back up right through the jungles. First time I ever heard of Managua, Nicaragua, <laughs> oh, Oaxaca, Mexico, spelled with an X. Yes. Uh, was on that from that trip. Now, when he was, um, it was right after the war that he lost the election to Congress. Right. And from that point, uh, your family kept the apartment in Washington D.C. That's right. And he started. Um, well, but even before that, though, he took a trip. Once he left Congress, uh, Lucius Clay asked him to make a trip to Europe. Uh, and do you know much about that trip? Well, I knew he went mm -hmm. and brought some nice things back, uh, mm -hmm. some very interesting things mm -hmm. back we have here in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and then he, he went back later to work with the mm -hmm. occupation for about a year. Uh, and uh, the year after uh, he was defeated, uh, I came back down here and went to school down here for a year, which, looking back for me, was a great experience. It wasn't the best school mm -hmm. in the world, but it was a great experience. Now, you went to Bruton Parker for a period of time. That was the school. Uh huh. Bruton Parker was still the high school, mm -hmm. and that was, I was in the eighth grade. And uh, back then, Bruton Park and a lot of high schools in Georgia are still just 11 mm -hmm. grades. So 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, I was just a freshman uh, in high school. Uh, rode Wait. my bicycle mm -hmm. back and forth from here to Bruton Park on the highway mm -hmm. back then. You wouldn't do that now. Well, as I was saying, your parents kept the apartment in Washington, and your dad did some lobbying um, after that, uh, that's right. That After that, he he was able to uh, get some representation mm -hmm. and people to represent in Washington. And so we went back up to the apartment we had kept it, sublet it, and uh, moved back in and stayed there till I graduated from high school. And we kept the apartment till 1962, a year after he died. Now, when did you go to St. Albans? Did you and you graduated from St. Albans well, in I Washington? Well, I started in St. Albans mm -hmm. at the very beginning in the mm -hmm. fourth grade, and went through and graduated. The only year I was not there was that year we were down here. Mm -hmm. How did you enjoy St. Albans? Was that? Oh, it was a great experience. As you were a teenager, uh, a lot of that time you were you were there. I guess I was a teenager the entire time, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, it was a good, well, not the entire time, because I started when I was <laughs> nine years old, but uh, uh, I enjoyed it. I liked it. It was and what were your experience. What were your goals and aspirations then? I don't know that I had any particular goals and aspirations. Mm -hmm. Make good grades. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thought, too. Your mother, having been a school teacher, did she have much influence on on your work in school? Oh, both my mother and my father uh, had a lot of influence. And my father probably had as much or more than my mother. Yeah. And uh, he was very intelligent and uh, 
uh, he very active mind, very creative mind, and uh, uh, I could be trying to work on a math problem, and he'd sit there and work with me on it, and work it better than me. And I don't know what mathematics I ever had in school. <coughs> but, uh, it was. Uh, uh, it, 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 the both of them, and they. Uh, I was very, ha very fortunate, and that uh, I could come down here for me personally, and, and play and go out and ride my bicycle, play with my friends, and go fishing up in Uncle Willie's fish pond, and, and uh, go around barefoot all summer, and, and then I, when I came, time to go to school, we went to Washington and. It was was not onerous at all, but I got, we got in the apartment. We did not have a television, and the uh, main thing to do was to study, and uh, I did, and, and I wouldn't take a thing in the world for it. That uh, sort of working, have time to work and time to play in a way. What persuaded you to go to Yale for college? My father. He had a friend of in the same office that he occupied when they were representing sugar interests. Uh, and his name is a name that I'm sure you hear now from, another, from his son. His name was Malcolm Baldridge. And he had gone to Yale and had been a football mm -hmm. player there. And he taught my father, I was making good grades at St. Albans, to, that I would tell him I would go to Yale. And of course, Malcolm Baldridge's son, they've got mm -hmm. a Malcolm Baldridge Business award now that mm -hmm. they give out, and his daughter Trish Baldridge was uh, the uh, uh, I think uh, Jackie Kennedy's uh, social secretary right. or something. But uh, that was what got me to Yale. My father always had uh, he had he had very high aspirations for anything he did. Uh, something we hadn't talked about that that we should is that uh, beginning in 1940, he was responsible for bringing in a number of different industries into mm -hmm. our little community here. He, uh, mm -hmm. uh, he'd seen the uh, textile industry in Winder, so he decided they needed a, a garment manufacturing plant, plant down here and uh, got some of the family members to put up a little money. and, and got it all together and, and uh, invested in a cut, make, and trim operation. Many years later, I was talking to Buffalo Jones, who was at the time running the Woodruff Foundation. And, uh, he told me, he knew where I was from. He said, yeah, I remember back in 1940, he was with some government agency. He said, we were training workers. And said, they sent all the ladies who were going to work at the shirt plant from Ailey over here, and we trained them. And what it did was give jobs to the women in the community. The purpose of it was to run a business and try to make money, but it had the impact. Uh, the, the farmers were all, men were farming, and all their wives came in and started working in the shirt plant. And later there were a number of cut, make, and trim li operations like that down here. Uh, in the later 40s, he got another group together to put some money uh, in and they went over to Mount Vernon and put in a, gonna make a, uh, build a, a pants factory. Uh, and the building's still there, but in the shirt plant he got his brother and nephews to run that and it, it made it, but the pants factory didn't make it. Uh, then uh, right after the war he was able to get a, a, a radio a broadcast license that a cousin of mine had in, in Savannah. We never had, my father never had any ownership interest in it. And then he got the, uh, uh, when the war was over, he was able to get a group together and acquire what had been a government-operated turpentine still, which became Vidalia Naval Stores, uh, which is now, of course, VNS Corporation. Uh, and he was always trying to do something like that. When he died, uh, he, they were up in North Carolina in uh, uh, Silver, North Carolina. He had gotten some type of permit to go look for minerals on government land. They felt there were minerals, and he was going to get some local people and go up and look 
the minerals and tried to develop that. Earlier than that, he tried to get the glass manufacturing people interested in using the sand around here for making glass. So that was really where he thrived, was in trying to do things like that. Yeah. In fact, when he died, we really wanted to put on his grave uh, a quote from Proverbs, uh, where there is no vision, the people perish. And we decided not to do it because we thought it might be misinterpreted as being critical of people. But uh, that was, uh, I think he got into politics because that was about all there was for a young man to do to move up in the world when he was coming along. But what he really enjoyed doing was where, I mean, not joy, that was where he was motivated, was in what I've just described. Yeah. It's always been interesting to me that while your parents uh, lived in D.C., that they became very socially active in the, in the community there. And of course, they had a lot of activities for congressional wives that your mother was involved in, but they, were also, they also joined the uh, Chevy Chase uh, Club, and uh, that was the place where they met and uh, socialized with many people who were also in government, like they were. Yeah. And I think your mother kept that membership on up. Um, oh, until she died. Right, exactly. So it was very important um, social um, sphere for them. Do you remember much about that in growing up? Oh, yeah. The, socially, in, in Washington, my folks were active, but it wasn't in what you call the Washington social scene. Uh, they, uh, we were very active. They had a Georgia State Society, which had a big dance every month at the Shoreham Hotel. And uh, back in the good old days, everybody, the men dressed up with tuxedos and the women in long dresses to go to a dance like that. Uh, and uh, my mother was active with the Congressional Club, and they did uh, join the Chevy Chase Club. It was uh, in the early 50s, about the time I graduated, not long before I graduated from high school. My father was active in the Scottish Heritage Society up there, the St. Andrews Society. Uh, and, uh, but they, we never lost our foothold in, in, in Georgia and in Ailey. Uh, you know, folks never bought a house up there. They, I'm sure they I know they talked about it and thought about it. Uh, but uh, the, uh, we we knew people, and I'm sure there are even more now, that when they went to Washington, particularly in Congress, and others who went up there to work in the government during the New Deal days, uh, they ended up being losing their roots in the state and just living up there number of members of Congress for that way, particularly in the Senate. Uh, but we never did. We, we kept our roots down here and, and, uh, and, and we come back, this was home. Right. I think they met such interesting people and the car, that correspondence comes in again where they maintained these ties on, you oh, know, after yeah. that. And they were very close friends with the owners of, what's the name of the farm in Virginia that um, was turned into a... Um, a place for entertainment concerts and um, Wolf Trap Farm. Yes, yes. They, they weren't the owners. Uh, that was Lord and Lady Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, Jumbo Wilson, Field mm -hmm. Marshal Maitland Wilson, who uh, was uh, in charge of the British forces in Egypt and in the Eastern Mediterranean during the Second World mm -hmm. War. Uh, my parents met them at a St. Andrews Society banquet in the 40s when uh, by then I get to I don't know if he was lord then but he became a lord uh, Wilson was over here when, with, as one of the liaisons with NATO or something and uh, my mother told a story about uh, how uh, they went to that thing and the, the speaker that night was Eisenhower and the Wilsons came, I guess, because Eisenhower was there. And Eisenhower was still in the Army before he became president of Columbia. Uh, I, I, I know that because I've seen pictures, photographs of it, and he had his uniform on. And uh, uh, 
uh, somehow uh, my mother and Lady Wilson kind of hit it off. Uh, but what really, according to my mother, broke the ice was that uh, they started, had the band and started dancing. And my father asked Lady Wilson to dance. And she said, oh, I, I don't dance. You know. She said, oh, come on, girl. And he just grabbed her and took her out and danced. And that just, oh, it just won them over. And they became good friends. And the Wilsons stayed in a number of different places around Washington, and they ended up staying at a place called Wolf Trap Farm, which was way out in Virginia, way out in the country back then. And we went out there one night for dinner, I remember. And uh, I remember because among the dinner guests was a one-armed British soldier. And he, they had you know, whatever chicken he carved and ate every piece of that chicken with one hand as well as anybody else could do with two. But uh, my mother and Lady Wilson particularly, Hester, she called her, uh, remained good friends right on until up into the 70s. Mary Jane and I went to uh, England, uh, about the only big continental trip we'd taken like that in 1971, and we went to visit Lady Wilson uh, where she was living at that time. Uh, that's, that's who that was. So they did have some interesting friends. Had some very yeah. interesting friends. Yeah. Um, you also went from Yale to Harvard Law School. Yeah. Did your dad have influence on that as well? About your, your going no, to Harvard? not to the same extent. That mm -hmm. was, I, was, I had the grades and the scores. That main thing, I guess here's the influence he had. He said, well, if you've got grades like that, you might as well go on to Harvard. Mm -hmm. So I did. I, and I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, was being an, uh, a lawyer an, an aspiration for you? Because you had a lot of lawyers in your, both sides of your families. I'd have to say not really. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, there were lawyers in, in my family. Uh, uh, I, I guess this is more subliminal, but my, my father was a lawyer, but he never really practiced law much. And uh, uh, I was... Quite frankly, at the time, I probably didn't have any idea which way I wanted to go or what mm -hmm. I wanted to do. But mm -hmm. I decided that if I had the opportunity to go to Harvard Law School, I'd go. A lot of my, one of my roommates and a lot of my friends and classmates from Yale mm -hmm. went, and uh, uh, and I'm glad I did. But mm -hmm. it's been a great experience. Well, after that, you were. Um, Three years an officer in um, Judge Advocate General's Corps mm -hmm. with U.S. Army. What specific events and people had the greatest impact on you during that time? Uh, well, I can answer that on a couple of levels. If, 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 if one spends time in the military, uh, particularly at an Army post where you see all kinds of people, and enlisted personnel and others in all walks of life. And when you're particularly in the legal side of it and see the ones with their problems, uh, one impact was you saw a lot, a lot of life. I'd really been fortunate in the sense that living in Ailey, I, I saw a lot of life. I, mean, I, I just have to say that the great experience of living down here was that I grew up with folks who had nothing. I grew up with people that, that lived in houses with no electricity, uh, white and black, uh, and, uh, and and saw just about all different types of people here. But the same was true in the military. So in that instant way, it was very uh, educational. Uh, at another level, uh, uh, I was there during the middle of the Berlin call-up. We activated two National Guard divisions, one from Michigan, I recall, came to Fort Benning for almost a year. We had hotshot lawyers in, the, in our legal assistance offices, privates, giving legal advice because they were in the National Guard division. Got called up. 
Uh, a little later, the Cuban Missile Crisis came along, and uh, one Sunday night, in the middle of all of that, they called me, and I by far was not the only one. Uh, go over and get all your shots, you know, which meant you're liable to go to Cuba. And uh, nobody knew what was going to happen for two or three days. And that was experience. Uh, it was a great experience for me to be at Fort Benning, be right there in Columbus. I got to know a lot of lawyers, a lot of lawyers my age. Being a member of the Georgia Bar, I, was, uh, I didn't, didn't and couldn't do any legal work there, but I was involved with it. Uh, so it, it was, a, and just being in the military for a s substantial period of time and uh, is, is a, I think, a, a very good experience. And for that period of time, you were um, here in the States, or did you go overseas at all? No, I didn't go overseas, no. Mm -hmm. Almost did when I went to Cuba, but <laughs> right. didn't go. I want to go back just a few minutes. We were talking about your parents, friends, and uh, I really wanted to have a little bit of conversation about Tassif, who was um, a person that they had met and who actually came to Ailey quite often to visit them. Oh, the, the painter. Yes. Uh, Tassif, yeah. Mm -hmm. Atanas Tassif. Mm -hmm. Well, he was a very unusual man, I guess. Anybody who was born in Bulgaria and lived in Prague and came over here and was an artist would be unusual. Uh, my father met him somehow in Washington in uh, the late 40s. And I remember the first night they had him out to the apartment for dinner and we talked. And I've often suspected one reason my father kind of co cultivated a relationship with him was because I liked to paint and draw when I was a little boy. Uh, and uh, I guess he thought I'd learned something from him, but that never happened. But uh, he became a good friend of the family and started coming down here at Christmas. And we uh, saw him up there and he got to be friends with some of the other members of my mother's family up there. Painted Senator Russell's portrait. Uh, and. Um, we, he'd have a bunch of the family members out to his little apartment and cook up Tassif burgers, which were just hamburger stuffed in bell peppers, but it was, it was good, and uh, we had a good time. And he was uh, had a lot of interesting stories to tell about living in Prague and growing up in Bulgaria uh, under the Turks. And I thought about all of that later when the Balkan stuff blew up because uh, his folks were the Orthodox and the Turks were their rulers at that time, pretty ruthless rulers. And he was an interesting fellow. Painted a number of the, my mother and father's portraits, my, the portraits of both my grandparents, sets of grandparents, mm -hmm. in the living room, and a lot of portraits, painted a lot of portraits here in Ailey of different family members. Uh, and others painted some of the Gillis family. Mm -hmm. uh, I know he did a lot of drawings of farm animals too, had, and, 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 and just and life in on, in this area. And other animals uh, mm -hmm. got drawings of the Ailey Baptist Church and of the, mm -hmm. the old Methodist Church where they changed the steeple, the old place, and a couple of other places around. And he would just draw something, uh, and he's very good. He'd go out to the Washington Zoo and sketch the raccoons lying up in the trees, and the lions, and other animals. What's interesting is to me is that he, had, he came here so often that uh, he now has, uh, or he did have his own uh, cottage out uh, back of the house that he called Tassif's uh, Palace. Tassif's and Palace, really. He had that because he, he was a great guy and a great guest, but he, mm -hmm. he was a better guest if you put him out in his own place. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, but he, yeah, he had this little old servant's house. From, there was a servant's house while I was in my time, but out back, and and uh, he, they, they established Tassif out there. He, uh, the place was cold, so he lined the walls with cardboard, drew pictures of animals on the cardboard, and 
termites came in through the cardboard and ate up about half the house. And my father had to refix the house and and uh, and fix it up a little bit nicer. And, and Tossy continued to stay out there. Uh, but he was a uh, he uh, he had some interesting things that nobody around here had ever seen. He ate yogurt as a matter of course. Uh, he came from over there. He said he was really Macedonian. And there's, I've always heard even back then that he, where he came from, people lived to be very old. And one reason they did because they ate yogurt way before there was any yogurt over here. And uh, he'd bring his own yogurt culture in a pot, in a saucepan pot with a shawl around it to keep it warm, I guess. He cultivated his yogurt. And he'd sit there at the table in the breakfast room and have the yogurt sitting on the table. And he would just sit there and ring back and he'd reach over and eat something, bring it up you know, like that. And it, uh, he also uh, brought uh, uh, something, a delicacy that nobody had here. We had eels here, but nobody ever ate them. But he had smoked eel. And he would bring smoked eel down at Christmas. And uh, uh, he had an old Nash car that he had acquired and learned how to drive over here, got a driver's license, had a DC tag. And uh, he would drive down US-1, come to Lyons, I guess, and turn west and come over here. And at the time, we had a sheriff here named Willie Claude Sharp who was had reputation for being very rigorous in his enforcement of the law particularly if you had an out-of-state tag. And uh, Tosse was driving into Ely one night a few days before Christmas after dark, you know, got dark early. And uh, they stopped him. And they went up to him and asked him, you know, had he been drinking or did he drink? And he said, well, yes, I, I drink Coca-Cola. And so they said, we want to look in your car. He got out and they opened up the trunk of the car and there was this eel sitting on a piece of wax paper on top of his suitcase. And never heard what their reaction was to that. But then they asked him where he was going. Well, he just passed the Ailey city limit sign. So they knew he was lying when he said he was going to Ailey. And so they said, well, who are you going to see in Ailey? And he said, I'm going to see Congressman Hugh Peterson. So then, of course, they let him go. Uh, and uh, a few nights later, my daddy ran into the sheriff at a Christmas function here and really got on to him about stopping his guest <laughs> coming into town. And, uh, and a little culture shock thing he encountered, I'd have to tell you, uh, mentioned Uncle Herman. Uncle Herman was a wonderful man, and uh, but he never been, went anywhere. He was, just lived around here, wasn't married, uh, and he, he chewed tobacco. And he chewed uh, brown mule chewing tobacco. Now, Tasha smoked, and he smoked like a European. He kind of put a cigarette in his, I, I hadn't seen that many Europeans smoke, but he put a cigarette in and I kind of puff it. You know, I don't think he, but he smoked. Uh, still lived to be very old. And they were both sitting in this library around Christmas one time, and nobody else in here at the time, and they, I can just see it. They were both sitting there, one of them in the rocking chair, the other one sitting there probably not saying a word. And about that time, Tosh said, people smoked in the house. They don't do it now. It did back then. Pulled out his cigarettes. And called Uncle Herman McBride. and called him McBright. He said, McBright. Cigarette? Uncle Herman looked over and said, No, I don't smoke. I chew. He said, What? He says, I chew. So I chew tobacco. And he pulled out his plug of brown meal chew tobacco. He said, Will you like some? Tossed being the European, you know, went in Rome. He said, Well, yes. So Uncle Herman cut off a square of triangle, whatever he cut off, I wasn't here. Gave it to Tosse. Tosse put it in his mouth, <clears throat> chewed it up, swallowed it. Uh, <clears throat> well, I 
I was down here for Christmas, obviously, and about that time, I was walking in the back door back here. And the first I encountered of it, Tossif was coming out the back door as I was going in. And his face was about the color of that white sheet of paper you got in your lap. <laughs> and he didn't say a word. And uh, he didn't come back till long after dark. He got out and walked all over town, probably was sick. And for thereafter, accused McBride of trying to poison him, the two old bachelors, uh, as he put it. And Tossif had uh, got, we put out stockings at Christmas, so he put out a stocking to his girlfriend, Louise, who was, of course, totally mythical. And he accused McBride of trying to steal Louise from him <laughs> by killing him, <laughs> poisoning him. Uh, and he was a very good artist and a very interesting man. Interesting to have around the house, particularly at Christmas. And I think in, in later years he continued a correspondence with your mother as well. Oh, he did. Even and after he, he went back to Europe. Yeah, and he kept coming down here. And he corresponded with others around mm -hmm. Some of cousins of mine here. He kept his bank account at the Montgomery County Bank in Ely. Even when he he left uh, America when he got, I guess, when he turned 65, uh, something to that effect, and uh, after he could get Social Security, mm -hmm. and went to Malaga and lived there for a while, and eventually was able to return to Bulgaria. And I guess sometime in the 80s, I got a letter from his nephew in Bulgaria telling me that he had died. Uh, but uh, he, was, he was livened up things around here. It was very interesting to have him. Uh, <clears throat> Hugh, your dad died in 1961. And that would have been, I guess, the time you were in the military. Right. Right. And so when you came out of the military, then you became a, um, you joined the firm of King and Spaulding in Atlanta. Right. And so tell us a little bit about your practice there, because that's a very prominent law firm um, and recognized internationally now. And you were there for 20 years. 30 years. 30 years, mm -hmm. okay. Well, as with so much in Atlanta, King and Spaulding, uh, was small when I got there and very large when I left. Uh, actually, by the time I got there, it was a much larger firm than it or any firm in Atlanta had been three or four years prior to that. All the firms in Atlanta had been at most uh, comprised of 10 or 11 lawyers. While I was in the Army during the early 60s, several firms began to combine. One firm got so big it had 30 lawyers in it, Hansel Post firm, and that was just a gigantic firm. And when I came with King and Spaulding in 63, I was the 25th lawyer. And it was a, a small firm, um, Hugh Spaulding Sr., and Mr. Bob Troutman, and Furman Smith and Will King Meta kind of were the main uh, the main partners in the firm, senior partners. Mr. John Sibley had been in the firm, but he was no longer in it. He was active with Sun was with Trust Company of Georgia, now Sun Trust. Uh, and uh, I've over the years practiced in different areas, more so than many there. Uh, did tax work. I did a lot of work for the Atlanta, we represented the Atlanta Housing Authority while they were conducting some major urban renewal in the 60s and early 70s. Um, involved in a very large antitrust uh, trial representing the Coca-Cola Company along with uh, Charles Gowan and Jack Watson and ended in a trial and a victory for us in, in 1972. Uh, and then later began to get into white collar criminal practice and did quite a bit of that in the last 10 or 12 years I was in the firm. 
and some other things. Uh, and it, over the years saw the firm and participated in the, the firm's growth uh, and uh, evolution uh, from a, a really a, a Georgia firm more and more into a national firm. Uh, uh, we had some prominent uh, partners and we had some who were not so prominent who were extremely influential in the state, uh, starting with those that had close connections with the Coca-Cola Company and the Woodruff interest, like John and Jimmy Sibley and uh, all of those. And then uh, in 1966, uh, one of the partners, Jack Izzard, called me and said, why don't you come around here and meet a fellow? He says, he's, he's going to be running for governor. I walked around to Jack's office and I want you to meet Jimmy Carter. And of course, Carter's lawyer, when he uh, had to contest the election that got him into the Georgia State Senate in about 1962, was Charles Kerbo who right after that came with King and Spaulding and, uh, <clears throat> from Bainbridge. And uh, so we saw Jimmy Carter run for office, run for governor in 1966. And he at the time was serving in the state senate with Mary Jane's father, uh, Senator Bill Fincher in Chatsworth. Uh, saw him you know, evolve from that on up. And later that fall in 1966, doesn't have anything to do with King and Spaulding, but it's interesting. I was a member of uh, the St. Andrews Society in Savannah, the Scottish Heritage Society. So I invited uh, Jimmy Carter to come go with me. And uh, he uh, drove over here from Plains. And I think I flew down somehow, but I met him here at the house. Ailey. And he drove me on down to, to Savannah. And we went to the dinner that night. And that banquet is a big deal in Savannah, mm -hmm. it and the Hibernian Society. St. Andrews is in November, Hibernian's in March. And they have all these notables. Uh, and that night, interesting in retrospect, one of my partners, a guy named Kurt McAlpin, had as his guest Jimmy Bentley, who had, I think, been insurance commissioner in Georgia and was, and was one of the few, a small group, along with Phil Campbell and a couple of others, who in 1966, uh, uh, 1966 and before that, maybe after 64, after the Goldwater thing, switched to the Republican Party. And everybody, at the time, thought Bentley had great prospects for you know, political future in Georgia. So Kirk had Jimmy Bentley as his guest, along with several others. I had Jimmy Carter, along with some friends of mine, as my guest. Well, nobody paid any attention to Jimmy Carter. Everybody paid attention to Jimmy Bentley. <laughs> uh, Carter was already running for governor for 1970. When we got to town, he said, before we go out to that dinner, he says, I want you to take me out to the television station. He says, I'm going to give him an interview. And he'd arranged it. So he went out. And uh, you know, we went to the banquet. And we came back to the old downtown motel. It's now a, a SCAD dormitory. And we stayed in the same bedroom. Yeah, it wasn't it was fairly common back then. They don't do it that much now. So we were roommates that night. And uh, the next morning, we got up very early, and Carter drove me back out to the airport. I catch a plane back to Atlanta, and as we were driving up Union Bag, the Union Camp, had a big plant on the Savannah River, and it had a big plume of smoke coming out all over everything. And Carter says, somebody's got to do something about that. And uh, you know, when he got to be president, and even as governor, he, he strong on the environmental things. He, he did, he did something. Uh, so that was an interesting 
Doesn't have anything to do with law, King and Spalding law practice, but it did in a way because that sowed the seeds for a lot of King and Spalding's growth and prominence over the years, uh, much, much of which came from uh, Griffin Bell, who um, Carter had made Attorney General right. because Kerbo got him to do it. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, then I, I saw the firm grow, uh, and uh, by the time I retired, we had offices in, had long since had an office in Washington, had an office in New York, had an office in Houston, had an office in London, I think, maybe one in Paris, and uh, was really growing. Had a lot of good people, a lot of strong people. And great firm, great place to be. And of course, it was fun practicing law there. Well, in your first um, 10 years there, you met your wife uh, when you were in Atlanta. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, first so. First five years. First five years. So, would you tell us a little bit about your wife and her family and then uh, your family together? Well, yeah, Mary Jane and I met. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, uh, the. Uh, one, in 1964, the American Bar Association uh, had a winter meeting in Atlanta. And uh, they had over at the old uh, Biltmore Hotel, uh, that's where the headquarters were. I went over there to some hospitality rooms. I ran into a guy uh, who uh, was going out to a, a TGIF party actually a Republican kind of party. A senator named Dan McIntyre was hosting for young people. You know. That day, walking around town uh, with some of the guys in the firm after lunch, we, uh, we they, they, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and tell it's not, not bad, but they had a place, a restaurant called Lebs back there in Atlanta at that time. And Lebs was a, Kind of a delicate, a big scale. It wasn't a, bigger than a deli, but it's that type of restaurant. And they had another little place downstairs called Pig Alley, and they had dancing girls. And the, the dancing girls had their pictures on, and they were, you know, one piece bathing suits, you know, mm -hmm. nothing today. But, and we were standing there, a bunch of us stopped to look at that, and two girls walked by. And the Guy with me, who also lived in Colonial Homes where I did, hollered out at him and said, Hey, girls, we're looking at y'all's pictures here. And one of them turned around and gave him a big, you know, go to hell grin, <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it, since Mary Jane's not in here. And uh, that was all. But that night, went to that party and went down in Dan McIntyre's basement and uh, was standing there drinking a beer and looked around, and there was that girl. So I went up and got to talking with her. Oh, you know, we hit it off. It's fine. And, and uh, so I asked her if she wanted we go out and eat, get something to eat. And we did. She said yes. And uh, uh, We went to a place on Peachtree, which then was just one little place called Papa John's. It was kind of an all-night eating place. I, I had a great time. I took her home, Colonial Homes Apartments, same place I lived. Told her good night and never called her. Well, about a year later, the same guy who had hollered out that thing about, hey, girls, look at your pictures, lived in cloning homes, had a reception for Charlie Weltner, who was running for Congress. He was running for re-election. And uh, out in back of his place, and I went over just to listen, and I looked around, and there was that same girl. So I went over, we got to talking. I said, you want to go get something to eat? She said, yeah. And so we went went back to Papa John's and uh, ate again, and we had a great time. And uh, I tell this story in front of her, too. She, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, it's not just a story, it's true. So we got back to her apartment, and uh, she was standing there, and I looked deep into her eyes, and I said, tell me your name. 
and uh, and she did very <laughs> very emphatically, and uh, and that you know, and then we dated for about a year and got married, and, and I married into a wonderful family. Her her father was in the state senate. In uh, 1964, he had just gotten elected from Chatsworth and uh, up in. Murray County, Whit Dalton, Whitfield County, and all of that, and uh, uh, we uh, so we we got we we've dated for about a year, and then I worked up the courage and asked her to marry me, and we got married in Chatsworth, and uh, and they her her it was it was just a great family. She had two younger sisters who are twins, and. Uh, uh, her mother was from Murray County, uh, and uh, descendant of the, some of the first folks who came in when the Cherokees moved out, uh, and they lived there. And her father was from Canton, who'd come up to Chatsworth to open up a drugstore. His father had a drugstore in Canton, and uh, they met the mother and married. Interestingly, again, uh, you see these. Indians who live up over in the motels they run. Well, when the Finchers opened their drugstore, Mr. Fincher opened his drugstore along with his brother, but when they got married, they lived up over the drugstore. And their only mm -hmm. transportation was a bicycle uh, in 1935. Uh, but they, he did very well with the drugstore and later got into the drive-in movie business. And uh, uh, and they were a political family. Not only was her father in the state senate from 64 till 90, but her mother's sister's husband, Charles Pannell, was on the Georgia Court of Appeals and was very active, very instrumental in Carl Sanders getting elected. And then one of his sons is a federal district judge, and the other, Jim Pannell, was in the General mm -hmm. Assembly for many years from Savannah, now lawyer down there. And... Uh, they are just, she came from the same kind of little town I did and went to school in the same kind of school I started school in. Uh, and uh, one way you know that is that back then what they called the restrooms for the schools was the boys' basement and the girls' basement. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they called it up there, what they called it over here. And we, of course, uh, lived in Atlanta and ended up having four children. Three boys and a girl, Hugh, and then William Fincher, and then uh, Richard Russell, and then our daughter Patience, Patience Eunice, mm -hmm. named for my mother and her mother. Uh, when uh, Patience was born, after three boys, it, that next morning, and, or a day or so later in Sunday school, I was talking to two guys, and they said, "Oh, I said, here y'all had a baby." I said, "What'd you have?" I said, "Had a little girl." Said, well, um, what, said, after all these years, you had a little girl. Said, Isn't that wonderful? Said, Waiting all this time and finally had a girl. Said, what'd you name her? I said, Patience. <laughs> and one of them kind of jealous. said, well, you said it with a straight face, too. <laughs> I said, no, that's really her name. And then later, when Patience was at NYU, folks would ask her if her parents were hippies because of her name. And, uh, but we've had a great life, and, and uh, back and forth, Mary Jane just you know took right into our family and my mother. She and my mother very close. Uh, which is which is interesting. Uh, I wouldn't say I shouldn't say interesting, but to have um, your mother to have an only son and uh, to get along well with her grand her uh, daughter in law is a wonderful thing. Well, it it is at, mm -hmm. at our rehearsal dinner, my mother. And her toast said that uh, patience. I mean, Mary Jane was 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 her miracle daughter. It's a wonderful tribute. Yeah, that she had her after she was sixty-five. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was you know, it's been it was a great experience. A great. Well, I just been very blessed. But it was so. We had such similar backgrounds. And she went mm -hmm. to Agnes Scott. And, Went to Murray County High School, Magnus Scott. And it's interesting, politics brought you together, and she was from a political family as well because of the two well, that's uh, right. parties that you went to were that's political right. parties. That's yes. right, one uh -huh. Republican and one Democrat. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, very interesting. I guess we had to go to the Democrat Party for it to really work. <laughs> Probably so. Being um, a Democrat. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit. Uh, let's go back to your mom again. So after after your your dad died, and uh, she was making her home here in Ailey, and she's always fascinated me as such a um, energetic lady, interested in everything, interested in people, um, and this you see through her correspondence. Yeah. And so many activities that she had. Um, civic activities and just activities of her personal interest. And so let's talk a little bit about about what she did here in Ailey, what her life was like here in Ailey after your dad passed and you were having your own life up in Atlanta getting started with your family. Well, uh, for one thing, uh, my mother never told me this, but I know she, knowing her, she determined after my father died that she wasn't going to let it get her down. It was very sudden. He had a stroke and died. Uh, and, uh, and she determined she was going to live here. Now, she had a cook, a lady named Marietta, who came in all the time. We had a man who worked here, Grady Bird, stayed with us. So she had support around the house. Uh, but uh, she already had her own life. Uh, through the, particularly the DAR and these heritage groups that she was very involved with, and she just expanded that. And uh, I would sit up in her room and write letters all over the state, stay in touch with her uh, the cohorts in those mm -hmm. organizations. She was never active politically in anything. Uh, and uh, and she was, uh, she was, she was, both my mother and father were so capable and and uh, and strong people in their own each in their own way uh, I've heard uh, you know, the, the people up north tend to think of the southern women as uh, you know the faint the kind of the kind that faint at the sight of blood and very delicate and all that and I've never not just my mother I've never seen any except maybe some Maybe a few who act that way, but uh, it's just the reverse. Uh, and my mother was very much that way. Uh, she was very outgoing to people. She was very sensitive to people. If you talked with her, you came away knowing that she was listening to you, paying attention to you. Uh, and uh, that's the way she did her relationships with her, her friends. She had circle here with my aunt across the street who'd come over here every night. This was home to her and, and, it, and she was part of us to us. It, she wasn't, we loved to have her. And then uh, her sister-in-law here, uh, married to my Uncle John C. and other people and friends around. Uh, so she had an active life, an active life in the little church here small church, so not any great circles and that kind of thing, but there was, I guess, the old WSCS Women's mm -hmm. the Society that... Uh, Christian Society. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the uh, Women's Society for Christian Service, WSCS. Mm -hmm. and, but then with the DAR, she had her connections all over the state, and my mother loved to drive. And that, my father died, and the only car they had was a Chevrolet. It was a year or so old, straight shift Chevrolet. And it began to kind of give problems, so she bought another car, Pontiac. And she drove that car all over the state, visiting, going to DAR meetings. And before my father died, she had a project in her mind that was a major project in her those years. It had to do with the DAR headquarters in Washington, D.C., which a right prominent building is down there um, between the White House grounds and the Washington Monument, right next to the Red Cross building. And uh, in that building, various states had rooms 
and they were generally, uh, they have antiques of, from Pennsylvania, or maybe dolls from Delaware, different things. And my mother said that when she went to Washington, maybe before she, she and my father married, she went to the DAR building, and she saw that a lot of states had rooms, but that Georgia didn't. And Georgia was one of the first states in the Union. And she thought Georgia needed to have a room. Later then, uh, maybe more after my father died, she began to get active to get a Georgia room in the DAR building. And she talked to the DAR people and somehow got them. And, uh, there was a men's restroom down in the lower level. It was a pretty big restroom. There weren't that many men in the D Daughters of the American Revolution mm -hmm. building. So they took that room, and her idea was to turn it into a replica of the long room of Peter Tondi's tavern in Savannah, where the Liberty Boys from the Revolution met. Peter Tondi was a Swiss, I think, who had a, had a tavern there. And uh, she went around, uh, raised money to get furnishings for that room. And uh, the fellow who uh, worked here, Grady Bird, uh, he used to talk about how he liked those dead presidents. You know what a dead president is? It's money. Because every bill, except uh, one, has the face of a president on it. I think Grant's on one. Of them. Well, Grant's the president, but there's one, Hamilton. Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she'd go around to these DAR meetings and tell these women she wanted all the dead presidents. <laughs> and she raised a lot of money for, the, uh, for that Georgia room and went around and, and, and found and, and was able to purchase through the DAR, uh, through that money, with that money, the furnishings for that room. He dealt with his fellow Williams down in Savannah, the one of the Midnight in the Garden of Good mm -hmm. and Evil. He was, he was an antiques dealer. And in 1992 or three, they dedicated that room in, uh, in, in the DAR building, and we went up to it uh, uh, to attend the dedication. And it's there now. And that was a project. My father died 30 years prior to that. It was a project that uh, was big for her, and she was very proud of that. And she, she also drove a lot of her uh, DAR friends to the national conventions. Oh, they go up every they year, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and then later she would have a friend who would drive her, and they, they'd go up and, and uh, get a room at Mayflower Hotel. Mm -hmm. and they'd have a little cocktail party in the room before they go. They weren't big drinkers. They'd mm -hmm. go out to the meetings, and she'd get involved in the politics of that some. It just, mm -hmm. She was actually state regent for Georgia, I think, which is a major office, I believe. I don't know whether she was. It may have been. I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe. I know she was very active in it. Mm -hmm. And in the DAC, the Daughters of American Colonists, mm -hmm. don't ask me what the difference is, but there's a difference. Well, there's uh, about five of them that she was involved in, the Colonial Danes, uh, the DAC, mm -hmm. uh, Daughters of the Colony something. The colonists and the DAR. The DAR. And um, the Magna Carta Danes, yeah, which did. takes the lineage back to England. Yeah, right. And so she actually traveled uh, to England, I think, one time to um, well, associate went, or do research or to. Uh, she to, went to England. Uh, mm -hmm. Went with her, with Olivia Russell. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was about when Sam Green died. They weren't here for that. Uh, uh, in the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but she was very active in all of that, and and uh, it, it just that was her life. Uh, after we, after our children came along, mm -hmm. her, our children were a lot of her life too. They mm -hmm. would come down here in the summer. They had cousins living right across the street mm -hmm. then, uh, who now live in. Well, they're all grown now, but they. 
and they had friends here and they loved to come down just the way I did when I was little. Mm -hmm. In high school and in college, you know, you get down here, you're in a whole different world. And they were a large part of her life. So. And she was also yeah. active in the garden club. Active in the garden club mm -hmm. and very always active in, with the, particularly the Russell family. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and every year uh, we have our Peterson reunion and she started in July and she started the practice uh, on Friday night before the reunion on Saturday we have a big watermelon cutting out here mm -hmm. in the backyard which we still do. She felt that people coming from so far away to come here for the reunion didn't need to just meet mm -hmm. one day but have another place mm -hmm. they could get together here uh, which, which they did. And, uh, and she was very, very active mm -hmm. in our our family here, and kept up with her nieces and nephews, particularly, uh, and and her brothers and sisters on the Russell side. When the, when she died, and they had put together that Sally Warrington put together mm -hmm. a little uh, publication on her, every person who put something in there told of an episode with my mother that was unique to them mm -hmm. and what she said to them mm -hmm. and how they talked. Mm -hmm. There no, weren't any comments, general comments about it. she was mm -hmm. a great lady and all of it. But one time I was sitting with Aunt Pat and she said so and so to mm -hmm. me and, and that's the way she was with everybody. Yeah. But, uh, and I think that's something that we saw a lot with, uh, we've seen a lot with the Russell siblings that um, I, I feel like that almost came from their mother, that um, uh, ability to really relate to someone else and to, and to perhaps give them, make some difference in their life. The quiet ability mm -hmm. to relate to somebody else was definitely mm -hmm. Grandmother Russell. Mm -hmm. the, there's also a streak of just a little bit of individualism, mm -hmm. uh, reminiscent of whoever it was, and I don't know who it was, who, who said they wondered why in the world Anna Dillard would marry one of those peculiar Russells. <laughs> so we got both. <laughs> Have the quiet uh, personality, but there's just a, a marvelous mm -hmm. uh, little, maybe it's the wrong word, wackiness among Russells. Mm -hmm. I've always thought your mother was a little feisty, but it was just really a strength that seems to come through. Oh, she was very yeah. feisty. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, when her, where she was in the middle of the family, you had to hold your own, mm -hmm. and she could and did. Also had five younger brothers, and when mm -hmm. we had three little boys, when we go to Chatsworth, Ms. Fincher, who had had three little girls, uh, took every piece of bric-a-brac off of every table and put it up so it wouldn't get broken. My mother never did. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one little eagle that's made out of a, a walrus a tusk that Hugh almost wiped all the paint off of because he liked to play with it so much. She put it up because she, she, you know, she knew boys and she could mm -hmm. handle them beautifully. Uh, and that was just kind of part of her. And she could mm -hmm. sing. Oh, she'd sing A, a Good Man is Hard to Find, and mm -hmm. put all the emotion into it. Or, oh, Johnny, oh, Johnny, mm -hmm. how you can love. And uh, she wrote poetry, which we've talked, we talked oh, about yeah. um, outside of this interview, I believe. But that was something that um, many of the Russell siblings did. They wrote poetry, but I know she would uh, write a poem to her siblings often as a birthday card. Yeah, yeah. But let's talk a little bit about a song she wrote about the war in Vietnam. Oh yeah, that, that, I, I really believe that song could have, uh, The Last Patrol, mm -hmm. uh, I believe it could have uh, been very popular, but mm -hmm. she didn't know and I didn't know how to popularize Market something it. But like it's, that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about this guy that you know, gets shot in Vietnam and while he's dying, he, if you tell mama, all, tell her all is well or something like that. And she'd sit at the piano and play it. 
And she played the piano back uh, when I was younger around here on Sundays in the summer. We'd get to the piano and she'd play and we'd sing hymns you know, one after the other. I never knew many popular songs. I knew all the hymns. She knew all the old songs. And she could you know, they'd instantly just pop out and sing them. And I know they had a piano in the Russell home, and so I had Still the feeling there. that uh, the yeah. Mother Russell and, and especially the girls could play. Yeah. Uh, but the others, I never knew of any of the others, except maybe Aunt Carolyn, who really, uh, where music was a part of their life. But uh, my mother was, was definitely that way. <laughs> oh, one thing I wanted to just talk about briefly too is uh, in the Russell uh, family in relation to your mother is that Mother Russell had um, 15 children, 13 that survived to adulthood. And uh, she was often by herself uh, because Judge Russell worked in Atlanta and so she was by herself in Russell with all of these small children. And she had a system of after a certain number of children had been born where the next child born would be um, an older sibling would be assigned to that child. This is your child, this is, and you will look after, you know, you'll help look after this child. And I can't remember who was your mother's child in well, the family. Well, was, but that worked because mm -hmm. of the first seven, five were girls. Right. And of the last uh, uh, eight, well, you can count the two that died, take those two out, the last mm -hmm. six, Four were boys, mm -hmm. and so uh, I've never really known about any, but, but uh, just one or two uh, that that really lingered in that way. Uncle Alec was my mother's, mm -hmm. and they they were very close. And uh, uh, Uncle Jeb was Aunt Harriet's, the sister mm -hmm. just older than my mother. That's why one mm -hmm. of Uncle Jeb's daughters named Harriet. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but uh, Uncle Alec was my my mother's boy, mm -hmm. and uh, and I thought she was also very close to her youngest sister oh, she Caroline. Was very close with Aunt Caroline, Caroline. Mm -hmm. but not for for a different reason. Right. It was the only mm -hmm. other girl that came along, mm -hmm. except Susan Way, who mm -hmm. who, who died. Passed. Uh -huh. uh, and they were very, they were about ten years apart, mm -hmm. and and they were very close. Yeah. Well, let's uh, switch gears just a little bit and go back to the naval stores and the Petersons. And so your dad um, purchased the naval store in 47? Yeah, he, he was able to get it acquired. He, mm -hmm. along with uh, uh, two of his brothers, really one of his brothers who put in some more money, and some of the other family members, along with uh, at least one other outside investor, uh, uh, Mr. Jordan from across over in Wheeler County, uh, they they acquired this operation. And uh, as he did with the shirt plant and and the radio station, he got one of his nephews to, to run it, Bartow Snooks, mm -hmm. my aunt Flora's son. Uh, and who grew up right up the street here, and his father had a turpentine still right out back of, uh, or across the road mm -hmm. from their house. So Bartow grew up in the turpentine business. He'd been in the Army, got out of the Army, came back, and got to run in the turpentine still. And um, uh, that's what it was, Vidalia Naval Stores Company. Uh, from about 1947 until the early 60s. And after I got out of law school, I came on the board. Not long after that, my father died. But in that period, the company had an opportunity through one of its customers to start handling some building materials. And uh, it's put it on as a sideline in Vidalia, but a good time to do it for some reason. And we had good prices and we sold them and that business grew and we began to open stores. And so now you have several, let's talk a little bit about how Vidalia Naval Stores has evolved today 
with the building materials, I think you have, what, five branches within that? Um, yeah, we changed the name because nobody knew anymore mm -hmm. what naval stores were, uh, from Valde and Naval Stores to VNS. Naval Stores, by the way, uh, refers to the gum turpentine products because so much of that was used in the old wooden ship days. Right. The tar mm -hmm. that was produced. And, and the longleaf pine trees were the excellent mast for the sailing ships. But we changed the name. and We've, for many years, had nothing but these stores around. And at one time, had about six or seven. And then they evolved back. We back up to about five or six, depending on what you call a store. We have some branches mm -hmm. uh, that sell building materials, mm -hmm. primarily to contractors who are building houses for people. Uh, we uh, started at one point of an activity that, that makes doors, which is now headquartered down here in Ailey, in the old Ailey Manufacturing Company mm -hmm. building, which had been the shirt plant. Uh, and we have a trust facility down in Midway, and we have a, 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 a brokerage-type operation called Wholesale Building Products, and then a construction uh, installation division called Procon. Uh, and Wholesale and Procon sell way beyond the market areas of where the stores are. Uh, and it's become a pretty good-sized company. This one, it's actually the largest of its kind in Georgia, is that not correct? Privately owned. Privately it's, it's owned. It's not as, not as large as Home Depot's mm -hmm. operation. But your focus is a little bit different from Home yeah, Depot. Yeah, they, they have a, uh, I don't know whether they even use that much anymore, but they have, they have a, a division that's supposed to sell to contractors as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, we're, we're, we're now the largest privately owned. Mm -hmm had two that were larger who went under during the recession, and uh, we, we made it through. And so it's not just, you don't operate just in Georgia, you do really pretty much in the southeast? Well, we, we have the stores in Georgia that sell to a limited mm -hmm. geographic market. We've got one store in Jacksonville now, mm -hmm. south side of Jacksonville. Uh, the other uh, division sell, uh, is, is going to sold as far away as Tucson, Arizona, and down into Florida and up. Yeah. Looking at jobs in upstate New York and, and Indiana, and Illinois, different places, as well as closer in in Atlanta and around. So this has really been sort of your second career. How, you know, after leaving King and Spalding as as a, a big city attorney, how how difficult was it to make a change from that to um, heading up VNS today? That it wasn't all that difficult because I was fortunate to have some good people in the company, including uh, Gary Campbell, our president and, and now the CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and I, we've continued to live in Atlanta mm -hmm. as much or more than we live down here. Uh, and uh, my role in it has been to develop the management team mm -hmm. for the company and provide some uh, my insight into it mm -hmm. to the extent it's worth anything been a lot of fun, been very mm -hmm. interesting. Business uh, calls for as much or more creativity than any other occupation mm -hmm. somebody can be in if you look at it that way. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't creative and aren't adaptable and flexible, you're either not going to grow or you're not going to mm -hmm. survive. Uh, it's been, I've enjoyed it. And I know you have some other relatives around here who are in, who are in the business with you in different roles. Uh, do you think one of your sons or daughter might even be interested in? There's no no indication of that at the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't don't know that. Mm -hmm. That would probably be unlikely. Uh, but uh, we we're developing mm -hmm. a good team, and I think that's going to be the way it would go. Mm -hmm. It's it's very interesting to see that the fam. I mean the the uh, store now um, or the corporation has like over a hundred years history having started with your grandfather back. Well, uh, not this before. company. But uh, as it, I mean, it evolved from the naval stores it, is what oh, I'm thinking. Oh, the naval of. stores yeah. activities mm -hmm. over right. But it's no, we're no longer in the naval stores business. Right. Because that all died out in the mm -hmm. 
late 70s and early mm -hmm. 80s in Georgia. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking of it being a natural sort of evolvement out of that into well, what was. you are today. Yeah. 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 How do you think, um, you know, this is a big, a big business that you have brought into Montgomery County and, and surrounding counties. And how do you think uh, Montgomery County is doing today in terms of its economy? I think it's struggling, mm -hmm. as is most of rural Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, the whole dynamics of the of our economy are, are focused on uh, centers rather mm -hmm. than uh, towns. Uh, Vidalia has some strength in that it's uh, uh, between Vidalia and Lines, have a strip there that has all the big uh, Walmarts and Lowe's mm -hmm. and uh, so for this area, that's, that's kind of the center of activity. They've got a big hospital there now. But uh, the reason for most of these towns to exist has ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, you don't have a lot of local farmers around mm -hmm. farms now. Everything uh, in the area of our economy is either going to boutique or going mm -hmm. to large national. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, that's happening with drug stores, happening with the hardware mm -hmm. stores, happening with, uh, and, and there's, there's no, uh, including Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, there's no, economic structure that allows the business group that used to provide the backbone for a community to exist. Uh, every town used to have the druggist, the guy that ran the hardware store, the grocer, mm -hmm. uh, the doctors, all of that, and they were the, uh, they were the uh, people who uh, had a little bit more income than others, the part of the community, kin to everybody, provided, helped provide the leadership and the cohesion in a, in a community. And you don't have that now. There's, I couldn't tell you. I know of one person, one man, who owns a drug, drug store in Vidalia named Phillips. And he's got a good drug store. He's a good man. But the old Lee Ace Hardware uh, is, uh, is no longer... Uh, Walmart, and Lowe's, just they couldn't survive, and that's true all over. And uh, that is changing the way these communities are are made up. You used to have a place like even Mount Vernon and Ailey, you'd have half a dozen uh, college graduate people here who were business leaders. Got people that go to colleges now, but it's not the same. It's mm -hmm. it's it's just a whole and in Atlanta. Fifty years ago, I used to tell my friends up north about Atlanta. I said every business leader in Atlanta lives within the city limits of Atlanta. Mr. Rich of Riches mm -hmm. lives in Atlanta. The people, the, the Paul Austin, CEO of the Coca Cola Company, lives in Atlanta. Uh, Robinson, what was his name, he ran the First National Bank of Atlanta, mm -hmm. lived in Atlanta, all the business leaders. And that's what made Atlanta such a strong uh, community, particularly the support of Mr. Woodruff and the Coca-Cola mm -hmm. Company, to come into the modern era. And uh, now all of the, the, on, the only bank left that's locally, has any local connections is SunTrust. And the Coca-Cola mm -hmm. Company is an international company based there, but and other big companies will bring their headquarters there, but it's, it doesn't have the the, 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 the leadership. Uh, and the same is true in the black leadership in Atlanta. But that's so that that's a long answer to say mm -hmm. that the economy of out in the state is is changing and very mm -hmm. fluid. And I, I understand the Ailey Bank has just um, gone right. out of business, and so you're close to Ailey Bank banking. went out with a flourish, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you see much uh, change in this area with the, we say there are changing demographics in Georgia now with the Asian and Hispanic uh, 
groups that are coming in to live in smaller communities and can you see that much in this area and how that may have changed the economy in any way? Well, I'm not down here enough to answer this fully, but mm -hmm. uh, at one level, it's a big change. Mm -hmm. When I was a little boy, the thought of having a Chinese restaurant in Vidalia, mm -hmm. Georgia, you might as well have a man from the moon come to Vidalia, mm -hmm. Georgia, uh, or a Mexican restaurant. And now there is at least one or two very fine Chinese restaurants in Vidalia, several Mexican mm -hmm. restaurants. Uh, so there are Asians in this, mm -hmm. and then the uh, Pakistanis and people mm -hmm. like that own mm -hmm. quite a few of the convenience stores. Uh, but And then the Mexican laborers are very important. Uh, I've often thought the state was very short-sighted in at the, the legislature in trying to run them out of Georgia mm -hmm. because the whole onion economy is based mm -hmm. on Mexican labor, uh, a lot of the pecan economy, all the labor-intensive mm -hmm. businesses are based on Mexican labor and immigrant mm -hmm. labor. As, interestingly, so was automobile manufacturing in Detroit and uh, all the mm -hmm. industry in, in uh, the Midwest in the early part of the 20th century. The, the Poles and the Russians and the Germans and the Italians all got up, came in and worked in those plants. So, uh, and, uh, and they, but nobody's trying to run them out of the country. Down mm -hmm. here they came in and now they're very unhappy with them being here. So there's a lot of, oh, there's a lot of Hispanic. But at the governmental and political level so far that you don't mm -hmm. see any mm -hmm. or much change. change. I know that um, a lot of farmers have um, lobbied the legislature about losing this labor force and what it has meant to their business. And um, I wondered if you had any sense also of what the um, bringing these people into the community as part of the community, how, how the community is accepting of the children in school, the families in the neighborhoods, do, do you see? I just don't have any sense Don't have that. a sense of that. No, it's a, mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's just, I don't know that there's a large Hispanic population mm -hmm. in this county in that way, mm -hmm. but I'm sure there is because a lot of them work in here and, yeah. and in, in Vidalia. Right, and I think there's, there are other you know, communities where we, it's very obvious, like in Gainesville in the poultry industry. Oh, yeah. and that was uh, true in Athens also. And then, yes, the uh, carpet industry and everything, mm -hmm. a lot of that. Uh, Hugh, let's talk uh, now a little bit about your relationship with Senator Russell, who was your uncle, your mother's brother. And um, he, of course, was in Washington a lot, although he came home more frequently than people in Congress do today. But um, what's, what's your earliest memories of him? Oh, probably uh, around Washington. Uh, I don't know how young I was, but playing with a bunch of little friends under a bush out in front of the, one of the apartment buildings down Cathedral Avenue from ours probably doing something we weren't supposed to be doing, popped out, and he was walking up Cathedral Avenue, coming from Ann Island's, coming up to our place. I don't know, it might have been 1941, 42. Uh, and, uh, but he was around, and I, I remember him m more in early years in Washington than in Winder, because in Winder it was there's so much more going on. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I, it makes me think of my own, my only real memory of my grandfather Russell. I just have to tell you that you didn't ask, but uh, uh, we went up to Winder, and of course I'm sure I, I know I well he'd seen me and all this, and, but I knew he was real old, and we went into the house, and I thought anybody who they never stopped growing. If they were real old, they'd be real big. And I was surprised he wasn't any bigger than he was. He was you know, big, but sitting at a table eating, a, I think, a soft-boiled egg or something. 
or milk toast, something like that. And then I remember uh, when he died, uh, I don't, all I remember was that we were down here, it was in December, I think, of 38, and we went, drove up to uh, Winder, and I swear this happened, I swear this is not a dream, and I've seen it, same thing later, so I, he wasn't in a coffin, he was lying in his bed in that back bedroom downstairs, and I went in there, my father took me in with him, I was three years old. And there were a bunch of men standing around the bed. He, he's lying there in the bed. Yeah. Best I can tell, it didn't traumatize me at all. But uh, I remember that. The only memories I have of him. And uh, I'd, I'd also have to say, I want to tell you a little bit about my grandmother, Russell, and then I'll tell you about Senator Russell. A uh, couple of things. and. Uh, I can get through it, one of them relates to Mary Jane, but uh, she she just had a, a sweetness about her that was, uh, you, know, you, you just, you, a young child just was drawn to that. And uh, back before she, she, in her later years, she got bedridden, but uh, when I was about five years old, five or six years old, we were playing in front of the big house in Winder. And I was playing out there in the front yard. At that time, there wasn't nearly as much grass out there. It was all sand and dirt. And I was playing with little patients, Uncle Alec and Aunt Sarah's daughter, the one who died mm -hmm. of leukemia, right. and other cousins. And uh, I threw some sand or something at the patient's face. She cried, and my mother came and jerked me up and took me in that back bedroom, one where Grandfather Russell had been, and just put me in there and left me. And I don't recall crying, I just recall being there. And uh, uh, I was just standing there, and then the door opened. And Grandmother Russell just walked in, and smiled. I don't recall what she said. But uh, that just meant a lot to me. Uh, I remembered that, and uh, she had a, she had a great mind. She was a very intelligent person, uh, and uh, but uh, to tie it into Mary Jane, the uh, morning after uh, the second Papa John's. <laughs> I woke up, and uh, I said to myself, that girl is the only girl you ever met. Who's like Grandmother Russell? So that's the connection. Mm -hmm. But getting back to Senator Russell, uh, he was around our apartment in Washington a lot. You know, the family had come over, and uh, he stayed with Aunt Anna and Uncle Gene quite a bit. It was taped with Aunt Anna during the war when Uncle Gene was over in Europe. And uh, uh, he was just there. He was Uncle Dick. Uh, he was, uh, he was a, we all, you know, were awed by the position he held, but he was just a, a, uh, a uh, he was so human, so down to earth. Uh, and uh, uh, would just talk, and he had the facility almost as strong, but the best at this was his brother Rob, who could talk to young people as equals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt a very close Uncle Rob for that reason. 
uh, talking about him a minute. Uh, he was a lot taller than all the rest of the Russell boys. And, but we were over at the Dillard reunion one August, and uh, I was probably 15. And uh, he didn't have, probably didn't have more than four more years to live, didn't know it. And uh, we, we got to call him one another cuz. Hey, you must be related to me. Yeah, I think you related to me. You must be my cousin. So we, but he was a, he was a marvelous man. Uh, but Uncle Dick had that facility as well. He, uh, and I remember him talking with my daddy and all about things. I remember him talking about one of the trips they took to Europe, and uh, uh, the uh, flying over. Maybe that that one in '43. Where they flew and what they saw, I don't remember the details of it, mm -hmm. but I just remember that he was, he was, uh, he he talked about that, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, oh, what was the name that, of his big staff member that then went on the Armed Services Committee, who uh, was before Bill Jordan? Bill Darden. Bill Darden. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Bill Darden had ordered some laundry get done, and he ordered it the wrong way, and they did it overnight and charged a whole lot of money for it. <laughs> it <made laughs> Dick got him upset. Uh, but I don't remember any details about Oh, the other thing I do remember. It was so it's interesting. There was a senator from uh, Rhode Island named Theodore Green, and he was a real New England Yankee. And they were over somewhere in Europe and Green had gone to the opera. And Uncle Dick had about as much use for the opera, you know, as he you know, did for a pound of dirt. And uh, Senator Green came back, they had the same room, and he began to carry on about what a fine opera it was. And Uncle Dick, he, didn't, he got so tired of listening to that. But when I, when I say that, then it makes me think what I heard my mother tell about Uncle Dick as a young man, you know, there's a song from, I think, Carmen, the Toreador song, Toreador, that kind of thing. And, uh, of course, the only song I ever knew was Toreador, don't spit on the floor, or use oh. a cuspidora, what do you think it's for? But uh, <laughs> I remember that one, too. <laughs> but uh, Uncle Dick going up the steps, bounding up the steps at the big house in Winder as a teenager, Toreador. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, he was around. I remember my father talking to him, saying he was making a big mistake ever getting messed up with Lyndon Johnson. My father had served with Johnson in the House, and knew and Johnson was a secretary to uh, 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 what was his name uh, from Texas, uh, Keiko. Uh, no, I'll think of it in a minute. Who who? whose place Johnson took in the, in the house, Kleberg. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and uh, my father didn't, didn't, have a, didn't, didn't have a real high opinion of, of Johnson, I think, as a person. Uh, but, uh, oh, I remember <laughs> there was a friend of my folks, a couple from Mississippi, although the wife was from, uh, from Cuthbert, Georgia, Aaron Ford and Gertrude Ford, and they, Aaron Ford stayed in Washington after he got out of Congress, and Gertrude had a lot of money. Her father was named Castello, lived down in Cuthbert, and uh, they were real characters, and they, Gertrude Ford had a little uh, chihuahua. I'd never seen a chihuahua before she had carried around with her, but they got my folks a parakeet. Named, they called him Jerry, and we had him in our apartment in Washington for a while. And uh, old Aunt Anna and Uncle Gene had come over, and Uncle Dick, Uncle Dick be sitting in the chair in the living room in Washington, and that bird would fly around and light square on top of his head. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody laughed, you know, Dick, that bird's on top of your head, look out. And he'd sit there, and he knew it was there, and he would come along with it. Uh, so we had, you know, Things like that. Uh, I reckon I can tell it now. Folks used to have big cocktail parties and have them in our little bitty apartment. 
and a woman down the hall from uh, us, uh, I won't give her name, but I walked in the kitchen. Uncle Dick was had her in a mad embrace. <laughs> 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 and, uh, well, nothing ever came of that, I don't think, beyond that mad embrace. But well, <laughs> I, we've always had the impression that he was quite the ladies' man. Um, I have a feeling he was. You know. mm. you know, what little I know, I think he darn sure was. He uh, had a couple of great loves in his life, but uh, especially in his in his early years, he was he was uh, not settling down at the time. But he no, had plenty of ladies' friends. No, no yeah. man, he, but. Uh, uh, and we'd go over to his office. I would go over to the office. And it was a great feeling to go over to his office and go in the center office building and go right in your uncle's mm -hmm. office. You know. uh, and, uh, uh, but I, I suppose the way I would summarize him was that he was, he was real. Mm -hmm. He wasn't pompous. He was highly intelligent, uh, had a phenomenal memory. Uh, I remember in Winder one time later on when he was having the emphysema, sitting there with his eyes closed in the living room, somebody was playing the, some song and he just singing right along with it and knew, knew the song, just kind of under his breath. Uh, but uh, he, uh, uh, I see one thing I thought of, now I might have to rethink it back up again, but, but he was, uh, Oh, had some real interesting conversations with him around at the dining room table in Winder. Uh, and uh, it, I got kind of carrying on one day about maybe he, just, he and I were there. Could have been others. I just remember that he and I were there. Something to the effect that about how people and politicians you know, needed to really stand up for what they believed in regardless. And, and I've forgotten what he said back, but he made me realize, whatever he said, that we're not there necessarily to express our views. We're there to represent the people who elected us. Now, you have to do it principally, but in a principled way. But, uh, and I've forgotten exactly how he put it, but he put it very well. Uh, Another thing around the dining room table one time, we were talking, and, I, uh, and he clearly felt that uh, that uh, uh, James Earl Ray did not act alone, and he made some comment. That, you know, he was James Earl Ray was in solitary confinement somewhere that that he figured at some point he'd finally crack. Tell. Of course, he apparently never did. Uh, but uh, little comments like that, I heard. Did he him. ever talk with you much about civil rights in, in general? No, not really. Uh, the, the night of the day when the Civil Rights Bill passed was the Friday before the Russell reunion. And he flew home that afternoon, that evening in one of those Navy planes to the Winder Airport. And a bunch of people went out there to see him and greet him. And but for some reason, I was supposed to go out there and give him a ride back. And, and he got in the car and he said, yeah. And the coming he made kind of surprised me. He said, you know, they had more dams and other things they could offer than we did. In other words, it was getting people to vote their way by promising. You know, Projects for the mm -hmm. districts. Like pork the, barrel. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, um, we really never, the one thing he talked about with civil rights was kind of interesting, not about civil rights per se, but my mother and I, my mother took him and me, I guess, out to the Chevy Chase Club in Washington. I had to have been, after my daddy died, and before we closed our apartment in the fall of 62, even while we were up there closing the apartment. And it was about that time that maybe James Meredith or somebody was trying to get into the University of Mississippi. And he told about talking with one of the Kennedys about it. And, and as I recall what he said, 
Kennedy, whether Bobby or the president, uh, was something to the fact, well, it, you know, he'll keep pushing this for a while, but then he'll go on and do something else. They were, mm -hmm. it conveyed a casual feeling, not a great commitment to civil rights that Johnson clearly had. Uh, and it was just an interesting side comment. And then, of course, something I'd mentioned to you before, mm -hmm. and it was the way Uncle Dick was also. Uh, we, Mary Jane and I got married in February and April of that year. And my mother had a big reception for us here to introduce us to the community, introduce Mary Jane to the community. And uh, Uncle Dick had not come to our wedding. And I know it was because of his emphysema. It was frightfully cold. It was seven degrees in Chatsworth the morning we got married. So he didn't come. He called me the day before we got married, but he didn't come. But he came down to that reception. And uh, I, think it was, I think it was Charles Campbell who drove him. Uh, but it may have, that may have been before Charles's time. It may have been Earl Leonard. Uh, I don't remember. But anyway, uh, they stayed, I think, at a motel or something in Vidalia, but came here for the reception, and oh, you know, and he went through the receiving line around, and then maybe he was staying here. Anyway, later on that evening, I invited him to come on back to the bathroom back there. I had a practice of never having drank all that much, but so it wasn't that, but at Christmas when my Uncle John C.'s family would come over here and have Christmas dinner with us, after my daddy died, I'd invite him. We, Uncle John C. and one of his son-in-laws, we'd go back to the bathroom. I had a bottle of Jack Daniels back there, and we'd stand around and take a little drink because we never drank out in the house. Uh, and uh, I mean, it wasn't that we, you know, that sounds maybe a little bit too austere, but that just back then. That was pretty much the practice back then. Yeah, I think. that's found the way it was. And, and some of the best drinking I've ever done has been back in that bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'd stand around and talk just for 20 minutes, come back out, and then go have Christmas dinner with everybody. Well, I invited Uncle Dick to come back there. And so he and I went back, and, and I got out the bottle. And I had one glass, I think. I may have, had, I may have fixed it, had two glasses. And uh, he put down the toilet seat, sat on the toilet seat, and... Uh, I sat on the tub, and uh, we uh, we sat down and took a drink, and he just kind of reminisced and talked, talked about time being over in Spain with the Air Force when he was on kind of vacation and that thing. And uh, then he started talking a little bit about the time he was engaged to Pat Collins. I didn't really know a lot about that engagement at the time. I knew it had happened, but, and I knew that it had broken off because she was a Catholic. But he, clearly he was had that on his mind that something working related to a wedding and me getting married, somebody getting married. And he began to kind of talk about it. And the one thing I remember was him saying something like, and then she just had to go talk to that priest. And... He didn't. I don't. He he didn't make it sound like and that. Just made me mad. But somehow that, like it exasperated him or something. Uh, and you could tell that that was still on his mind. And that makes me think back that three years before that, two years before that, uh, in January of '65, uh, I went up to Lyndon Johnson's inauguration, and he had. I guess told me that he's going to give me very fine tickets, a ticket to watch the inauguration and then very fine ticket to watch the parade right down in front of the presidential reviewing stand. Gave the other one to Nancy Green and we sat there. But uh, I got up early that morning in Atlanta, I caught a plane and uh, caught a cab to the Senate office building. No security back then, just get up and walk or go in the office and walked into the receptionist. I guess Marge Warren was there, somebody, and they 
And I walked on into his office. He was sitting at his desk that morning, getting ready to go over to the inauguration. And when I walked in the room, that big office, that desk down at one end, walked in that little side door right there beside his desk, he looked at me. He didn't say, oh, good morning, glad to see you. He looked at me and said, you get married. <laughs> and uh, again, I could see that that was on his mind. And, and in, I guess in a sense, he might have said, I don't want you to go to have happen to you what happened to me. But uh, when that that was uh, uh, he he just had that that way about him. Uh, he was a very he he was one of the most powerful men in the world, and yet he was very humble, very and wasn't practiced. It was just the way he was. Uh, it's very family oriented. Very family oriented. It had pictures of family all over that uh, office. And he did a lot, as I'm sure your records will show, or they should show, uh, to support the ones in the family who needed support, and there were those. Uh, you know, Bill Russell worked in his office all the time. He was at George Washington. You know, Dick, Dick Bowden. Actor Dick Bowden, mm -hmm. probably never shot a gun in his life, was a guard <laughs> <laughs> on the, at, the, mm -hmm. at the Senate office building. And, and he, others he helped and supported in different ways, I'm sure. One thing I was very uh, touched by is that he had a habit of writing a newborn in the family to say, welcome to the family. Uh, your name was the name of, and he would tell whatever ancestor it had that name, because we always have said the Russell names are repeated over and over in each generation. It's one, one reason it's so difficult to, to know who is who at a particular yeah. point in time. And, um, and he would usually write at least a page uh, or more, you know, about... Like, like uh, his mother. Uh, the welcome, uh, welcome to the family and yeah. what, what it meant to be in the family. Yeah. Did you ever get one like that? Do you recall, or do you have one? No, because all our children were born after he died. Uh huh. But I was thinking about if he had written you when you were born. I, if he did, I, I mm -hmm. doubt it back then. That probably may have uh, come along later. Come along later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, but he was, uh, and he he basically, with the help of Bobby Russell, and later Richard. Uh, was uh, uh, was the heart and soul of the Russell reunion, uh, and uh, ran the program up there, mm -hmm. conducted the program, uh, and uh, I think about the fact that that he had so many nephews who were in the military mm -hmm. and who were in harm's way. Of course, the most noticeable was Buddy Russell, but others that were right in the middle of things. John Russell was right in the middle of things in, in Vietnam. And Rusty Nelson was so much in the middle of things that he came home a pacifist. I mean, he had just such a rough experience seeing mm -hmm. men die around him, I, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Jimmy Bowden was a, a Navy carrier pilot, but nobody ever, and of course I was in the JAG, I, I didn't see any action, wasn't any action then, I'm glad I didn't see any action, uh, in the sense that it, it pretty rough stuff, but uh, the, uh, uh, they, they, nobody ever got any favors for being Senator Russell's nephew uh, in the service. Yeah. In fact, it was just the reverse you know, with Buddy, where he was shot, and others had the bad experiences they had. Uh, and he talked about how Rusty Nelson said, he said, Rusty Nelson was on one of those boats and said he had a man standing right next to him just got killed, you know, that type of thing. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe others would have tried to do something to 
insulating any of the family members, but nobody ever asked for it. He never even thought about it. You know, he was a great uh, fan of sports, especially baseball. Oh, he yeah. Loved. We went to baseball games. I mm -hmm. went to the baseball games with him some, but he went a whole lot more than I did. I know one time a bunch of other cousins were up there, and we went out to the Washington Senators mm -hmm. baseball game. He was a big baseball fan. And uh, uh, I don't recall talking with him much about that. But we've, we've always been told how well he knew the statistics I have no doubt teams, that he, he, could he just, just had that kind off. of mind. Mm -hmm. Back in the summer of 1954, I drove for Marvin Griffin when he was running for governor. My father reigns that, and it was a great experience. The last time they ever had a governor's race where you have a candidate go around the state with a hillbilly band and a sound truck and everything put up somewhere in the feet. And we went in a little store, drug store, I think it was, in the town in Fairmount, Georgia. And I know right where it is because it's on the way to Chatsworth. We've been through it many times. And uh, the man there didn't have any idea who I was. And Griffin wasn't with us at that point, I think. But the guy said, yeah, they're all all right. But he says, and none of them like Dick Russell. Said he'd come into a room and he'd say, hey, George, hey, Jim, hey, Frank. He knew everybody's name. And uh, that registered with that fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was you know, Uncle Dick's strength and capability. Did you help campaign for him in 1952 for president? We all went to the convention. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't know that we were much help, but we had a big time. It was quite an experience. Uh, we, uh, I drove, I rode up with my mother. I was 17, I could have driven, but I rode, and Aunt Sybil and Mariana. I remember that. And uh, we got up there, and a number of us cousins were there. Dick Bowden was there, um, Mariana, I, Alec Russell, maybe some others. But we had, and the people around called us the Russell Sprouts. <laughs> Uh, and we'd go out to the palace and cheer and come back. And they had a uh, had a whole floor of the Palmer House Hotel there, and uh, had all the headquarters. And and we hung around the, that, but uh, there wasn't any there was no campaigning much that we participated could have done. High school kids, but we lent our moral support. And, and other, of course, Bobby Russell was up there, very much involved in it. And I think Uncle Rob was tucked away in a hotel room somewhere. The federal judge wasn't mm -hmm. supposed to be doing any of that, mm -hmm. but he was. Well, you've he, been a, an advisor for him from the very beginning, no, I think. Oh, very it's, close. Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think Uncle Dick really suffered blows when Uncle Rob died so young, of lung cancer, in 1954. And then Bobby, his son, who Uncle Dick viewed as the up-and-coming political star in the family, and probably was, died of cancer uh, in uh, 1965. Uh, and I know that troubled him. Uh, Ellick and I were riding around with Uncle Dick right after that, there in Winder, and he was he was talking how, the way he put it was, he said, I'm going to miss Bobby, but I know that the fellow who's going to miss him most is going to be Ernie Vanderbilt, which is probably true. Mm -hmm. But Uncle Dick was going to miss him a lot, mm -hmm. too. And then he told us, you know, you guys are going to have to get in and carry on with the family and that mm -hmm. type of thing. Uh, but I think he, uh, as both uh, on the, emotional side and just on the practical support side. Uh, he lost the two people who he really had, he knew were in his corner. camp, in his mm -hmm. corner, and, uh, and were politically savvy uh, type people. Well, you know, he said um, 
After the 52 campaign, he said, I was carried to the mountaintop. And, of course, things didn't materialize for him. And right after that, he took a um, trip to Venezuela and just sort of dropped off the scene, you know, shortly after that. So it obviously had quite an impact on him to lose that campaign. Did you notice any change in him when he came back? Or? No. What I remember him saying about why he got into it was that people were so concerned about Esther's Kefauver and the impact that Kefauver was making that they wanted him to get into it and go down to Florida and places like that and keep Kefauver from winning a bunch of delegates. Uh, and uh, uh, I know he got my father to go with him down into Florida uh, campaigning in the primary there. Uh, I don't don't recall, and I think he didn't have much time to to lick his wounds because right after that's when the Army MacArthur hearings started, mm -hmm. I believe, in '53 or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got. Or was it before that in '51? Maybe it was. Because I was thinking that it was '51. Right. Because that put him on the national that stage. That put him on the national stage. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I stand corrected mm -hmm. on that, but he, uh, I, and when we were around him in the family, you just, you didn't see, he, none of that crowd was the kind that was going, oh, woe is me, I just mm -hmm. lost the race, mm -hmm. so, and, and as far as mm -hmm. his attitude and personality, well, shoot, his sisters mm -hmm. wouldn't have let him, mm -hmm. but I don't think that uh, had a lasting effect on him. Now, he had, um, as we said, he was very close to Bobby and a, a lot of his nephews, but he chose you and uh, your cousin, Richard Russell III, to be the executors of his estate, which is quite a, a show of trust. And um, do you have any idea why he selected the two of you, or had, did he ever talk with you about that? Not why, no. I have no doubt that if Bobby had been alive, Bobby would have been perhaps the executor of his estate. I don't know. But, uh, and I, Richard and I were both lawyers, and when you think about it, uh, uh, until you get to young Richard Russell, Uncle Fielding's son, there are no other lawyers among my uh, cousins at that mm -hmm. level. Uh, yeah, but aside from that, I, he never, he asked mm -hmm. me to do it, but he never told me why. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite a responsibility, one you still are dealing with today. <laughs> well, it was. We've just, just really kind of brought it to an end. But I remember being with him up and we'd go up, spend some time with him in uh, Walter Reed. And I remember him going over the... Uh, the the design of his tombstone, that big stone, mm -hmm. he, he, he worked that out where he wanted to be buried. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, he, he got me and, and, and Richard up there. I spent a lot of time with him, Walter Reed, working on his will, mm -hmm. uh, which he uh, working out the specific bequests he wanted to make to various uh, people, grandchildren and others. Um, and uh, uh, it, again, we were the only only lawyers in the family. And, and he was using us. He wasn't using some other estate mm -hmm. lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have that much experience with Wills and all, but I think Richard did. And, and back then that was all relatively simple. There's no, there's, there's no trusts involved, except the trust of the land going to. He gave a lot of thought to the disposition of the home place and of the property. It already had a, some type of trust that he and maybe Uncle Fielding and Uncle Ellick were trustees of that 
maybe owned the cemetery. I've forgotten which. It, we blended in with his estate's trust. <clears throat> but he was, uh, and he, he didn't say it in so many words, but he obviously wanted all of his grand, uh, great, his nephews, nieces and nephews, and great nieces and great nephews to uh, get something. And we were able to sell the, the land that we, uh, he had quite a bit of land, all of which he had acquired, I believe, before he ever went to the Senate, all around Winder, back when it was just dirt. And it had some, <coughs> and it become much more valuable. And uh, each one of his great nieces and great nephews got a right nice inheritance from him uh, that would be very meaningful, particularly some child in school or something. And part of that money went into a trust for those that were not uh, until they turned 21. If anybody who was, any of that generation who was living on the day that his will was probated uh, inherited a part of it. And uh, that took a while. But uh, uh, he, 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 did, he, he did it. You know, he really benefited a lot of the family who, who, for whom that was, that was meaning to everybody, but very meaningful to some. It took us a while to finally get the estate wrapped up for a combination of reasons, but it is now completely wrapped up. I remember also uh, going back on something entirely different. In uh, 1966, Carl Sanders was trying to run Uncle Dick out of the Senate by saying he was going to run against him. And uh, I heard some, he, he, really, he really put the pressure on people uh, to support him. I don't think he needed to, but he did. And I saw him one time with a group of state senators at a some function around Atlanta, and he just, uh, I've forgotten what he said, Brooks Pennington was in that group and some others, and, but he he was, uh, I, just, I wish I could remember what he said, but he, he, was letting, he was letting Sanders know one way or the other that he would, Sanders would be in for a fight. and. Uh, People had to choose who they're going to be for, and all those guys, of course, said they were for him. And, uh, he he had he really had to fend off a a, a, a challenge there. Sanders was serious trying to. Don't you him. think that came about because he had just had that um, tumor uh, removed? Oh yeah, Sanders and, knew he was sick. Uh huh. And 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 he had emphysema, and I'm sure people knew that. And Herman Talmadge had done that to Walter George mm -hmm. in 56, I guess it was, whenever it was. And, uh, and that, uh, he, he, he geared up for a fight and, of course, ended up not having one. But, uh, uh, and I've heard others talk about things he said and did at the time that that's kind of saw him in action and he didn't. Before that, he never really had any serious opposition my entire life. That I, Not, uh, 36 was the 36 last was one against last Gene Talmadge. Yeah. 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 Uh, and it's so interesting that when the, <clears throat> the um, campaign didn't materialize, in other words, Sanders didn't really come out for the campaign, uh, the senator had all of, uh, had as much money returned, whatever was not spent, was returned to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember I went over to the Georgia court building one time. I was going to see Bobby, I guess. I got on the elevator and Bobby was on the elevator and he was on the Court of Appeals. 
And this was before, Bobby died in 65, so it was before then, and Sanders was trying to, already putting the pressure on. And uh, Bobby said, we got him now, we got him. And that's when they had gotten, um, when Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson, called up Uncle Dick and asked him to invite Carl Sanders to go with him hunting at Johnson's LBJ Ranch. And uh, uh, that was a slap at Sanders, you know, mm -hmm. so, and, and I think Sanders got mad and refused to go. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, but I, I really saw more of, because Uncle Dick didn't have much in the way of political challenge, mm -hmm. and, except for that one thing with Sanders. My, my view of him was much more just on the, I hear him talk about the things that I've told you about. I may think of others after mm -hmm. y'all leave. I don't think I'll think of many, but <clears throat> uh, it was more just as, as, a, as an uncle, as a family member. Uh, I, I have a, I've got a frog in my throat. Uh, Alec and I used to ramble around the house, <coughs> and I looked, and we looked in a closet in the bedroom. It's across the hall from what became his bedroom upstairs, and there was an old Winchester lever action rifle, and uh, a real old one. <coughs> I. Uh, I went to Uncle Dick after that, and I said something to him about that rifle. I've forgotten what it was, but I didn't ask him to give it to me. There's something about it, and he said, well, you, I'll just give you that rifle. And he did. I got it here in the house now. And uh, I'm sure he did that with other nephews in, in different ways. Uh, oh, I remember one time out back, we were down there, uh, spring vacation when I was in high school and I had a friend with me and a friend of mine from Switzerland, he went to St. Albans with me. So he was in a whole different world coming to Georgia and uh, we went up by Winder and Uncle Dick and Aunt Anna were there and they had found some cat around the house that they didn't like. And they wanted to get rid of that cat, so he got me to put the cat in the car, and we took the cat down to Statham and put him out down to Statham. <laughs> Came back, uh, and uh, uh, but it was, it was that's that's not very historical, <clears throat> but that's. It's interesting you would say that because I was thinking about um, at a later date there was a, there was a cat at the house also that, and this was. I think uh, he and Modine had an ongoing thing about the cat. Modine, uh, who who cooked for him when he was home and oh, helped yeah. clean house, um, wanted to get rid of the cat, didn't want the cat in the house. And so it was sort of like an ongoing battle between the two of them that he wanted the cat there. It may have been Modine wanting to get rid of that other cat. Right. Modine ran things around there. Mm -hmm. Uncle Dick said if she'd had an education, he'd make her his chief of staff. She was powerful. Right. And, uh, uh, it was, uh, and, it, it, and he, you know, he, he really enjoyed and relished coming back to Winder. And back for a long time, the Senate didn't, the Congress didn't meet in the fall, and he could spend the, the fall there. Uh, and uh, I don't think he did a whole lot while he was there, but he enjoyed, you know, just enjoyed being there. And again, amongst the family. I think we've covered a lot of material today. Yeah, I think I can't so. Think, I can't think of anything that we might have missed, but we might think of something next week. <laughs> well, you've been very thorough with your questions, and I've tried to answer them best to know how. Well, I appreciate it. That, uh, it's, uh, it's really is so proud of what you and everybody at the Russell Library doing uh, to preserve the memory of this man that we just all loved and admired so much. Uh, it's, 
-hmm. So, and I'm very proud of the way his legacy has been carried on in very constructive ways. Uh, uh, one very frustrating thing to me is that his, so many people view his legacy as just involved with the civil rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I've, of course he was involved with that. And uh, I don't think he was involved grudgingly, but I think he was also involved as an advocate for the people he, he represented and felt had elected him. And I, and I'm sure other family members have always been proud of the fact that he, while you know, Gilbert Fite classified him as a racist and what he did, mm -hmm. but from growing up in the South, Uncle Dick was not a racist. Mm -hmm. There were racists down here. And, and they were very overt, very obnoxious uh, in their views. Uncle Dick uh, took the position that he took and the people should, you know, like in the, the Civil Rights Bill, that if a fellow did not want to serve somebody, he didn't have to serve him. He shouldn't be made to serve him, that type of thing. You might disagree with his position, but it's a principled position. It's not a racist position. Uh, and then from what I saw and what I know, uh, he did so much more, particularly in the area of national defense. I've always suspected, and you may know, that he did a whole lot more, particularly in the area of intelligence, than we would ever ever know. Probably why they named a nuclear submarine for him rather than a than an aircraft carrier. Uh, and uh, he was so highly respected. Mary Jane and I went up there in 1960. They drove up there, and we uh, <clears throat> got to Washington on a Sunday afternoon, and we rode up Constitution Avenue and rode by the Senate office building, and out on the street was that Chrysler parked. Mm -hmm. And I knew Uncle Dick, and it was right outside of his office window, and I knew he was sitting in there reading. Uh, the next day or so, we went to his office, and he took us over. And by then, emphysema had him. He was not easy for him to walk, but he took us over, got on the trolley, and went over to the Capitol and took us up to the family gallery. And they were having the debate on the anti-missile missile system. Big deal back then. And the Senate was had every member there. And, and Spiro Agnew, the vice president, was presiding. And we went in and listened to that debate. As we walked up and walked toward the, the family gallery, he was taking us. And the ushers up there falling back, you know, like the Lord was coming. And Uncle Dick wasn't a magisterial guy at all, but boy, they, they saw the respect they had for him. And he took us in and we sat down. And we watched the debate. And all during that debate, uh, Uncle Dick sat in his chair, which was on the aisle, his, his desk, and right across the aisle from him was, what's the senator from North Dakota, Milton Young. Mm -hmm sitting there. And Uncle Dick over like this, talking like this, and Milton Young was over like this, talking, and they were just talking. I'll bet you they were talking baseball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, a Republican and a Democrat, mm -hmm. and obviously on very good terms, and, uh, and, and just sitting there talking. Now, they were listening to the debate, but the way that debate goes, you know, they, and the one thing that really frustrated me was Uncle Dick got up and said a few things, but he could not physically say much because of his emphysema. And John Stennis from Mississippi had to make the points or whatever mm -hmm. their side was. And I thought, you know, John Stennis is a fine senator and a fine man, I'm sure, but he wasn't... I knew that if Uncle Dick had been able to been able to get up and talk. I'd love to have heard him mm -hmm. because I think he would have been 
very, so much more effective, just the way he would talk. The emphysema had him, but the memory of him and Milton Young just sitting there talking. And of course, Milton Young later came down to Winder, and he, Gilbert Fite was from North Dakota originally, mm -hmm. I think, and Gilbert Fite took him around the Russell home place. Uh, one other thing I remember in that connection was when Uncle Dick died, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the big plane with all the senators coming down to the funeral got diverted because the weather was so bad. But I was in the big house in the living room and I saw two men come up to the front door. And I went to the front door and opened it and it was Hubert Humphrey and this new senator from Florida, I've forgotten his name. Uh, Hubert Humphrey had gone out of his way to come to Uncle Dick's funeral and uh, if two fellows had, in the Senate had been on, couldn't have been on more opposite ends of so many positions and even personalities. In fact, I heard somebody say one time that Uncle Dick, oh, maybe I read it in Humphrey's book, uh, uh, The Education of a Public Man, something like that, <laughs> that he got elected to the Senate and he was standing in the, out outside the, chamber in one of those lobbies and Uncle Dick was standing over talking to some other people and heard Uncle Dick say, I can't understand why the people of Minnesota elected that damn fool to the Senate. <laughs> but uh, Humphrey came to his funeral. I think that was one of the things that really um, marked his career and that was a mutual respect that, you know, unfortunately we don't have today, but was um, really a, a character trait of his as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, Hugh, I thank you, and I thank you for the support you've given the library all these years. It's been such a pleasure to work with you and to get well, to know the family over these years. Well, Lord, we've, we're going to keep supporting it, and thank you for you personally and all the staff in the library for what they do. It's uh, just is a, it, you've developed a, just a great national institution there, and it's going to get bigger and better. Thank you.